is cast from the joys of Eden. Vote, I say. Uh, no, parson, said Josiah Broom, pushing himself to his feet and clearing his throat. <clears throat> I don't think we should vote. I think it demeans us. I am not a man of violence, and I fear for all of us, but the facts are simple. Minir Nu, you say, is not a true man of God. Yet the Bible says, By their works shall you judge them. Well, by his works I judge him. He healed our people. He carries no weapons. He speaks no evil. The woman, Sharazad, whom you urge us to believe, bought guns from Minir Skazi and then loosed the demons upon our community. By her works I judge her. To vote on such a trade would be a shame I will not carry. Spoken like the coward you are, shouted the parson. Do not vote then, Broom. Walk away. Turn your back on responsibility. Look around you. See the children and the women who will die, and for what? So that one man, whom we do not know, can escape the penalties of his treason. How dare you call the man a coward, stormed Beth. If you are right, he just accepted death rather than shame. I've got two kids, and I'd give my life to see them happy and healthy, but I'll be damned before I give someone else's. Very well, said the parson, fighting to control his anger. Then let the vote take in all the people. And let the Lord God move in your hearts when you do so. Let all who wish the man knew to be returned to his people walk over there and stand behind me. Slowly, some of the men began to shift, and Fared rose. You go with him, Ezra Fared, and you don't come back to me, shouted a woman. Fared shifted uneasily, then sat down. In all, twenty-seven men and three women moved to stand behind the parson. Looks like that sells it, said Beth. Now, let's see to the cook fires. She turned to leave, then stopped. Slowly, she approached Josiah Broom. We don't always see eye to eye, Minir, but for what it's worth, I'm sorry for the things I said to you, and I'm right proud to have heard you speak tonight. He bowed and gave a nervous smile. <laughs> I am not a man of decisive action, Beth, but I, too, am proud of what the people did here tonight. It's probably meaningless in the long run, but it shows what greatness mankind is capable of. Will you join my family and me for a meal? I would be glad to. Chapter 27 Shanu and Skezi walked to the crest of the last hill and found themselves looking down on a lake of dark beauty. The moon hung in the sky between two distant peaks, and the surface of the water shone like silver. By the shoreline, the campsite was lit by fires. The wagons spread like a necklace of pearls to reinforce the perimeter walls. From where they stood, all seemed peaceful. This is a beautiful country, said Skazi. God-forsaken, but beautiful. Shano said nothing. He was scanning the horizon, seeking any sign of the reptiles. He and Skazi had passed through the gap in the wall and come across many tracks, but of the enemy there was no sign. Shano was disturbed. As long as he knew where his enemy was, he could plan to defeat or avoid him. But the daggers had vanished, the tracks seeming to indicate they had headed for the woods to the west of the campsite. Not much of a talker, are you, Shanna? When I have something to say, Skazy. There seems to be a meeting going on down there, said Shano, pointing to the centre of the campsite. Well, let's get down there. I don't want decisions taken without me. Shano walked ahead, leading the stallion. A sentry spotted them, recognising Skazy, and the two men were ushered through a break in the perimeter wall. As the parson strode to meet them, Shano saw that his face was flushed and his eyes angry. Trouble, parson, he asked. A prophet is not without honour, 
save in his own land, snapped the parson. Where are the other men? All dead, replied Skazy. What's going on? Swiftly the parson told them of the meeting and what he described as its satanic outcome. It might have been different had you been here, he told Shano, but the Jerusalem man did not reply. He led his horse to the picket line by the lake, stripped the saddle, and brushed the stallion down for several minutes. Then he fed him grain, allowed him to drink at the lakeside, and tethered him to the line. Shano wandered through the campsite seeking Beth McAdam. He found her by her wagon, sitting at a fire with Josiah Broom and Nu, her children lying asleep beside her, wrapped in blankets. "'May I join you?' asked the Jerusalem man. Beth made a space for him beside her, but Broom stood. "'Thank you, Beth, for your company. I will leave you now.' "'There's no need to rush, Josiah. Where is there to go?' I, I think I'll get some sleep. He nodded to Shano and walked away. A man does not like me, said Shano, as Beth passed him a cup of bakers. No, he doesn't. You heard what happened? Yes. How are you faring, no? The shipbuilder shrugged. I am well, Shano, but your parson is unhappy. He feels I am a devil's disciple. I am sorry for him. He is under great strain, yet has performed wonders holding the people together. He is a good leader, but like all leaders, he has a belief that only he is right. A burst of gunfire came from the western woods, more than a mile away. Shano stood and gazed across the open ground, but he could see nothing, and the sound faded. Returning to his seat, he finished his drink. I think I know how I might get home, said Nu. The temple at Ad had an inner sanctuary, where once a year the elders would heal supplicants. They had Sipstrasi. If the end came suddenly, perhaps the stones are still hidden there. A good thought, said Shano. I'm riding there myself. Come with me. What do you plan to do there? asked Beth. It is said, by the parson and others, to be a city of beasts ruled by a dark queen. I shall go to her, tell her of the reptiles and the attack. But she's evil, protested Beth. You'll be killed. Who is to say she is evil, answered Shano. The parson has never seen her. No one has come beyond the wall in years. I trust my own eyes, Beth McAdam. But the beast back in the town, the lion creature, you saw it? It was terrifying. I also met such a creature when I was in need, Beth. He healed my wounds and tended me. He told me of the dark lady. He said she was a teacher who worked among the people of the lion, the bear, and the wolf. I will not trust to rumor. I will make no judgments. But if you're wrong... So be it. I will come with you, Shano, Nu said. I need a stone. I need to return home. My world is about to die, and I must be there. Shano nodded. Let us walk a while. There are matters we must speak of. The two men strolled to the lake and sat by the waters. When we spoke on the hillside, said Shano, you told me of the king and his evil. But you did not say his name. Tell me, is it Pendaric? Yes. The King of Kings. Is it important? I owe the man my life. He saved me twice. He came to me in a dream three years ago and showed me his sword, saying that if ever I saw it in life and had need of it, I should reach for it and it would come to me. When I fought Sorrento in the cavern of the Motherstone, I saw the image of the sword carved on an altar. I stretched out my hand and the blade appeared. Later, when the cavern flooded and I was dying, Pandaric's face appeared beside me, leading me to safety. I do not understand all this, Shano. What are you trying to tell me? I owe him. I cannot go against him. Nu picked up a flat stone and skimmed it across the water. 
There was a time when Pendarik was a good king, even a great one. But the sons of Belial came to him and showed him the power of Sipstrasi when fed by blood. He changed Shano. Evil swamped him. I have seen children hauled up by their ankles over the altars of Molech Belial, their throats cut. I have seen young women slaughtered in their hundreds. But I have not, though I know you speak the truth because Pendarek told me he was the king who had destroyed the world. He will fall whatever I do or do not do. No skimmed a second stone. I build ships, Shano. I shape the keels. I work the wood. Everything in its place and its rightful order. You cannot start with the deck and build around it. It is the same with Pendarik. You and I are servants of the Creator, and he also believes in order. He created the universe, the suns and moons and stars, then the world, then the creatures of the sea. Lastly, he placed man upon the earth, all in order. What is this to do with Pendarik? Everything. He has changed the order of the universe. Atlantis is dead, Shano. It died twelve thousand years ago. Yet it is here, its sun shining alongside our own. The spirit Pendarek who saved you is yet to be. The king beyond is not yet him, you understand. The evil ruler who is trying to conquer worlds beyond imagination has not yet met you. Only after the doom of Atlantis will he come into your life. Therefore you owe him nothing. There is another thought too, Shano. You have already gone against him, and perhaps he now knows of you. Perhaps that is why he came to you three years ago. He already knew you, though you had no knowledge of him. My mind feels like a kitten chasing its tail, said Shano, smiling. But I think I understand. Even so, I will not go against him directly. You may be forced to, No, told him. If two ships are lashed together in a storm and one is holed, what happens to the other? I do not know. They both sink? Indeed they do. Then think on this, my friend. Pendarik has joined our two worlds together. There is a gateway to the past. What happens when the oceans rise? Shano shivered and gazed at the stars. In Balacris, he said, I had a vision. I saw the tidal waves sweeping towards the city, higher than mountains and black as the pit. I watched it roar. It was a terrible sight. You think it would pour through the gateway? What would stop it? Both men were silent for a while. Then Shano reached into his pocket and removed the golden coin he had found in Shiran's cave. He stared down at the engraving. What is it? asked Nu. The sword of God, Shano whispered. Bull reined in his horse and listened to the sudden flurry of gunshots. He had followed the daggers at a discreet distance, watching them climb into the timberline, guessing their objective was to circle the campsite and attack under cover of darkness. He'd been just about to ride back and warn the parson when the shots shattered the silence. He glanced back at the distant camp with its twinkling fires. If he returned now, he would have little to report. He drew his gun and checked the loads. Then, with pistol in hand, he steered his horse into the trees. He rode slowly, following a deer trail, stopping often to listen. The wind was picking up, and the branches above him whispered and crackled. But every now and then the wind would drop, and then Bull thought he heard sounds of roaring beasts. Sweat beaded his brow. He pulled his hat from his head and wiped his face with the sleeve of his shirt. You've got to be crazy, boy, he told himself, touching his heels to the mare's side. She was a good cattle pony, mountain-bred for stamina and speed over short distances. 
that her ears were pressed flat against her skull and she moved skittishly, as if a scent on the night breeze frightened her. The wind died, and Bull heard a terrible growling from her head. He pulled on the reins and considered riding back. Instead, he dismounted, looped the pony's reins around a branch, and crept forward. Pushing aside a thick bush, he gazed on a scene of carnage. The bodies of reptiles littered the clearing beyond, and giant bears were ripping at their flesh. At the centre of the clearing, he saw a flash of golden hair as the body of the woman Sharazad was dragged away into the night. Swiftly he did account. There were some forty huge creatures here, and he could hear growling from all around him. He backed away, his pistol cocked. Suddenly a colossal bear reared up alongside. Bull rolled and put a shot into the gaping jaws that towered over him, but a massive taloned arm swept out, hammering him to the ground. He landed heavily, but managed another shot as the beast moved in, its mouth spewing blood. Jacques leapt from the undergrowth with a serrated dagger in his hand. He landed on the bear's back, and the knife plunged into the beast's right eye. It fell with a great crash. Bull scrambled to his feet and ran back for the pony, the reptile moving alongside. Reaching his mount, Bull scrambled into the saddle, dragging the reins clear. From all around him came the sounds of huge bodies crashing through the undergrowth. Jacques hissed and waited, his bloody dagger raised. Instinctively, Bull stretched out a hand. "'We'd best get out of here!' he shouted. Jacques reached up, took the hand, and vaulted up behind Bull. The little pony took off down the deer trail as if its tail was on fire. They emerged onto open ground and galloped clear of the trees. "'Much good fighting,' said Jacques. "'Many souls!' Bull dragged on the reins and glanced back. The bears had halted by the tree line and were gazing after them. He allowed the pony a short breather and then headed in a walk towards the campsite. "'I ain't sure as how you'll be too welcome, Jacques,' he said. "'The parson's likely to boil you in oil.' The reptile said nothing, its wedge-shaped head resting on Bull's shoulder. "'You hear me?' There was no movement, and Bull cursed and rode on. The sentries allowed him through, then saw his passenger. Words swept the campsite faster than a fire through dry grass. Bull climbed down, twisting to catch Jacques' falling body. He laid him on the grass, then saw the awful talon cuts on his shoulders and back. Blood seeped to the ground as Jacques' golden eyes opened. Many souls, he hissed. He blinked and looked up at the faces gazing down. His eyes misted, his scaled hand reached up and took Bull's arm. Cut out my heart, he said. <sighs> the golden eyes closed. Why did you bring this demon here? asked the parson. Bull stood. They're all dead, parson, God be praised. This one was Jacques. He rescued me back in the woods. There's creatures there. Damn big, ten, twelve feet tall. Look like bears. They wiped out the reptiles. The woman's dead, too. Then we can return to Pilgrim's Valley, said Beth McKellum. Now that's what I call a miracle. No, said the parson. Don't you understand? We were led here like the children of Israel. But our work is only beginning. There is the great Hur to be destroyed, and the sword of God to be loosed over the land. Then, in truth, God will bless us. The wolf will lie down with the lamb, and the lion eat grass like the cattle. Don't you see? I don't want no more fighting, declared Beth. I'm going home tomorrow. Murmurs of agreement came from the listeners. Listen, parson, you've done right proud by all of us. If it weren't for you, we'd all be dead. I'm grateful, and I mean that. 
You're always welcome in my home, but that's where I'm going. Home. I don't know anything about this whore of yours, and I don't care a damn about some sword. Then I will go on alone, said the parson. I will follow God's path. He walked away from the group and saddled a horse. Shano moved across to him. Be sure of God's path, parson, before you attempt to ride it, he said. I have the gift, Shano. No harm will befall me. Won't you ride with me? You are a man of God. I have other plans, parson. Take care. My destiny lies with a sword, Shano. I know it. It fills my mind. It swells my heart. God be with you, parson. As he wills, replied the other, stepping into the saddle. Chapter 28 Araxis pushed the computations from him and stared at the midday sun. He was a frightened man. He had been four hundred and twenty-seven years old, sick and dying, when Pendaric first had him summoned to the Winter Palace at Belacris. But the Sipstrasi had changed his life. The king had healed him, given him back his lost youth. Yet since that time there had been many astrologers, and seventeen had been put to death for causing the king displeasure. It was not that Pendaric did not wish to hear bad omens, rather that he expected the astrologers to be exact in their predictions. However, as all initiates knew, the study of the fates was an art, not a science. Now Araxis faced the same predicament as many of his erstwhile colleagues. He sighed and rose, gathering his parchments. A doorway appeared in the wall, and he stepped through, holding his head high, pulling his slender shoulders back. Well, said the king. Araxis spread the parchments on the table before Pendaric. The stars have moved, sire, uh, or rather the world has shifted. Uh, there is great difficulty in deciding how this occurred. Some of my colleagues believe that the world, which, as we know, spins around the sun, gradually changed its position. I myself tend towards the theory of a cataclysm that tipped the earth on its axis. We exhausted two stones in an effort to discover the truth. All we could determine for certain is that the land you showed us was once below the ocean. You are aware of the prophecies of the man Nu Kazizatra? asked the king. I am, sire, and I thought greatly before bringing this theory to you. He says the earth will topple because of my evil. Are you telling me you concur with his blasphemy? Majesty, I'm not a leader, nor a philosopher. I am a student of the star magic. All I can say on the question you raised is that all the evidence points to Atlantis resting for thousands of years on the seabed. How this will occur, I cannot determine. Or when. But if Nu Kazizatra is right, it will happen soon. He said the year's end would see the doom of Atlantis. That is six days from now. Has there ever been a king with more power than I, Araxis? Oh, no, sir, not in all recorded history. And yet this cataclysm is beyond my control? It would appear so, sire. We have seen the future city of Ad, and our own star tower encrusted with seashells and the muck of oceans. Serpiet will be leading his legions through into that world in three days. Then we will see. Is it possible that we can learn from the future and alter the present? Ah, uh, there are many questions hidden in that one, sir. The future will tell us what happened, but can we change it? In the future, the cataclysm has already taken place. If we avert it, then we change the future, and therefore what we have seen cannot exist. Yet we have seen it. What would you advise? 
close all the gateways, and hold all the city motherstones in readiness for any shift in the earth. Focus all the power of Sipstrasi on holding the world in balance. All the world? That would take all the power we have. And what are we without Sipstrasi? Merely men. Men who will decay and die. There must be another way. I will wait for Serpiat's report. And uh, Shahrazad, sire? She is dead. Killed by stupidity. Let us hope it is not an omen. What do my stars show? Araxes cleared his throat. There is <clears throat> nothing I can tell you that is not already obvious, sire. Uh, this is a time of great stress and greater peril. A journey is indicated from which there is no return. Are you speaking of my death? stormed the king, drawing a gold-adorned dagger and holding it to the astrologer's throat. I always swore to be truthful, Majesty. I have remained so, whispered Araxis, staring into the gleaming eyes of the monarch. I do not know. Pendaric hurled the astrologer from him. I will not die, he hissed. I will survive, and so will my nation. There is no other law in the world than mine. There is no other god but Pendaric. Clem Steiner hauled himself up from the bed in the wagon and pulled on his shirt. His chest wound dragged on the stitches and his leg felt numb, but he was healing well. He dressed slowly and climbed over into the driver's seat. Beth was fixing the traces to the oxen, but she stopped as she saw him. Damn if you ain't as stupid as you look, she stormed. Get back and lie down. You break those stitches and I won't put them back. Samuel giggled, and Steiner smiled down at the blond boy. Don't she get fired up easy? Samuel nodded, his eyes flicking to his mother. Suit yourself, said Beth. If you're so anxious to be up and moving, climb down and help Mary with the breakfast. We're leaving in an hour. Shannon arrived as the injured man was negotiating the painful climb down. Clem was out of breath by the time he made it to the ground and clung to the brake, his face chalk white. Shannon took his arm and helped him to the cook fire. All was there to rescue me, Shannon. I'm starting to look on you as a mother. I'm surprised you're alive, Steiner. You must be tougher than I gave you credit for. Clem managed a weak grin, then lay back as Shannon sat beside him. I hope you've purged yourself of the wish to kill me. I have that, Steiner answered. It'll be downright bad manners. What was all the uh, commotion during the night? The reptiles were wiped out. Your friend Bull can give you the details. A sentry gave out a shout of warning, and Shano left Steiner and ran to the perimeter. More than a hundred of the bears were moving slowly across the open ground. One man leveled a rifle, but Shano shouted, Don't shoot! And reluctantly he laid down the weapon. The beasts were of prodigious size, with massive shoulders and hairless snouts. Their arms were out of proportion to their bodies and hung low to the ground before them. Mostly they walked on their hind legs, but occasionally they dropped to all fours. Shano climbed over the perimeter log and walked out to meet the animals. You a crazy man, shouted Skazy, but Shano waved him to silence. He walked slowly forward and then stood, his hands hooked in his belt. Close up, the creatures reminded him of Shir Run. Though their bodies were bestial and twisted, their eyes were round and humanoid, their faces showing glimpses of past humanity. I am Shano, he said. The beast stopped and squatted down, staring at him. One, larger than the rest, dropped to all fours and moved in. Shano found his hands itching to grasp the pistol butts, yet he did not. The beast came closer still, then reared up before him, its taloned arms flashing past his face and coming to rest on his shoulders. The creature's face was almost touching his own. 
Shan No, it said. Yes, that is my name. You have killed our enemies, and we are grateful. A talon touched Shano's cheek. The great head shook. Mm, not enemies, Shano. Ryder brought one to your camp. He is dead, Shano said. What do you want in the land of the Dionai? We were driven here by the reptiles. Now the wagons will return to the valley beyond the wall. We mean no harm to you or your people. People, Shano, not people. Things, beasts. He growled, lifted his talons from Shano's shoulders and squatted on the grass. Shano sat beside him. My name is Keril, and I can smell their fear, said the creature, angling his head towards the camp. Yes, they are afraid, but then so am I. Fear is a gift, Keril. It keeps a man alive. Once I knew fear, said Keril, I knew the fear of becoming a beast. It terrified me. Now I am strong, and I fear nothing, save mirrors or the still water of pools and lakes. But I can drink with my eyes closed. I still dream as a man, Shano. Why did you come here, Carol? To kill you all. And will you? I have not decided yet. You have weapons of great power. Many of my people would be struck down. Perhaps all. Would that not be wonderful? Would that not be an answer to prayer? If you want to die, Carol, just say the word. I will oblige you. The beast rolled to its back, scratching its shoulders on the grass. Then it reared up, its talons once more touching Shano's cheek. But this time it felt the cold metal of his pistol resting under its chin. A sound close to laughter came from Carol's fanged mouth. <laughs> I like you, Shano. Take your wagons and leave our lands. We do not like to be seen. We do not like grubbing in the ground for insects. We wish to be alone. Carol stood, turned, and ambled away towards the distant woods, his people following him. Magellus lay on his stomach watching the scene, enhancing his vision and hearing through the power of the bloodstone. Beside him, Lindian's cold gaze also rested on the Jerusalem man. He handled that well, said Magellus. And did you note the speed with which his pistol came into action? Yes, answered Lindian. But how did he know the beast would not kill him? Can he read minds? Is he a seer? Magellus elbowed himself back from the skyline and stood. I don't know, but I would doubt it. The Lord, our father, would have warned us of such talent. Would he? Lindian queried. He admitted it was a test. Magellus shrugged. We will see during the next three days. Why have you remained with me, Lindian? Why did you not ride off like Rodiel? The slender warrior smiled. Perhaps I like your company, brother. He walked off towards his horse, leaving Magellus staring after him. Curiously, he realized his words had been true. He did like Magellus. The giant had helped him many times when they were growing in the war pens, when Lindian had been small and weak, and Magellus was easy company, unlike the arrogant Rodiel, always so sure of victory. He vaulted into the saddle and grinned at Magellus. It will be no pleasure to kill you, thought Lindian.
But that was the real secret of the test. Smaller and weaker than the other hunters, Lindian had developed skills of the mind. He had watched and studied, learning the secrets of men. Pendaric loathed Rodiel and disliked Magellus. Yet each of them, in their own way, had the talent to succeed the Atlantean king. And that was the doom they carried. For, with Sipstrasi, a king needed no heirs, and the last talent a man should develop in Pendaric's presence was that of charismatic leadership. No, better to be like me, thought Lindian, efficient, careful, and undeniably loyal. I will make a good satrap of Acadie, he thought. The two hunters rode together for most of the morning. In the distance they saw lions, and they passed a small deserted settlement of tiny huts that aroused Magellus's interest. He dismounted and ducked to his knees to enter a doorway. Moments later he emerged. They must have seen us coming and scampered off to the trees. Fascinating. They rode on, guiding their mounts up a steep slope and halting on the crest. The city lay before them. Lindian disguised the shock he felt, but the breath hissed from Magellus's throat, turning into a foul obscenity. He studied the wall, the line of the docks, the distant spires of the temple. "'Where is the sea?' he whispered. Lindian swung in the saddle, his eyes scanning the mountains and valleys. "'It is all different. Everything.' "'Then this is not Atlantis, and that monstrosity—' is merely a replica of Ad. But why would anyone build it? Look at the docks. Why? I have no idea, brother, said Lindian. I suggest we complete our mission and return home. We must have passed a score of places where we could waylay Shanno. Magellus could not tear his eyes from the city. Why? he asked again. I am not a seer, snapped Lindian. Perhaps the king created it to disturb us. Perhaps this is all some dark game. I do not care, Magellus. I merely want to kill Shano and return home. That is, if Rodiel does not beat us to the quarry. At the sound of his enemy's name, Magellus jerked his gaze from the white marble city. Yeah, yeah, you're right, my brother. But Rodiel's arrogance is, I think, misplaced this time. You recall the teachings of Lacritus? First, study your enemy. Come to know him. Learn of his strengths, and in them you will find his weaknesses. Rodiel has come to expect victory. Only because he is skillful, Lindian pointed out. Even so, he is becoming careless. It is the fault of these new weapons. A man can at least see an arrow in flight, or hear the hissing of the air it cuts. Not so with these, he said, drawing the pistol. I do not like them. Rodiel does. Indeed he does. Though when has he faced an enemy as skilled in their use as the man Shano? You're taking a great risk in allowing Rodiel to make the first move. How will you feel if he rides in and kills the Jerusalem man? Magellus chuckled. I will bid him a fond farewell on his journey to Acadie. However, it is wise when hunting a lion to consider the kill, not where one will place the trophy. There is a stream yonder. I think it is time to locate our brother and watch his progress. Chapter 29 New Cassisatra felt awkward on the horse he had borrowed from Skazy. He'd never enjoyed riding, and on every slope he closed his eyes and prayed as he swayed in the saddle, his stomach churning. I would sooner ride a storm at sea than this... Uh, this creature. Shano chuckled. I've seen sacks of carrots ride with more style, he said. Do not grip with your calves, just the thighs, letting the lower leg hang loose. And when going downhill... Keep her head up. My spine is being crushed, grumbled Nu. Relax. Settle down in the saddle. Oh, by heaven, I've never seen a worse rider. You're unsettling the mare. The feeling is mutual, 
said Nu. They rode on through a wide valley, leaving the wagons far behind. The sun was obscured by clouds, and the threat of rain hung in the air. Towards noon, Shannon spotted a rider approaching them. He reined in and took out his long glass. At first he thought the man was elderly, for his hair was bone-white, but as he focused the glass he saw that he was mistaken. The rider was young and wearing a black and silver tunic with dark leggings and high riding boots. He passed the glass to Nu, and the shipbuilder cursed. It is one of Pendaric's killers. They are the hunters. He is searching for me, Shano. Best you ride away. It is only one man, Nu. Maybe so, but such men you would not want to meet. They are reared in war pens. They fight and kill each other from their earliest days. They are bred for strength, speed, and stamina, and there are no fighting men to equal them. Believe me, Shano, ride away while there is still time. Please, I do not want to see you come to any harm. We share that wish, my friend, Shano agreed, watching as the rider moved ever closer. Rodiel smiled as he saw the men waiting for him. Truly, his rewards would be great, for the second rider was the traitor Nu Kazizatra, a prophet of the One God, and a man opposed to violence. He could not decide whether to kill him here or take him back to face Pandaric's justice. He halted some twenty paces from the pair. John Shano, the King of Kings, has spoken the words of your death. I am Rodiel the Hunter. Do you have anything to say before you die? No, said Shano, palming his gun and blasting Rodiel from the saddle. The Atlantean hit the ground hard, a hammering pain in his chest. He tried to draw his pistol, but Shano rode forward and fired a second shot that smashed his skull. Sweet Kronos, exclaimed Nu. I cannot believe it. Neither could he, said Shano. Let us move on. But what of the body? That's why God made vultures, answered Shano, touching heels to his stallion. Two miles away, Megellus opened his eyes and gave a deep, throaty chuckle. Oh, joy, he said. Lindian returned his stone to its pouch and shook his head, but Megellus laughed again, the sound rich with humour. What I would have paid to see that scene, the satrapy of Arcady, <laughs> that and ten more like it. Oh, did you see the look on Rodiel's face as Shano fired? Was it not wonderful? Shano, I am in your debt. I will light candles to your soul for a thousand years. Oh, Belial, how I wish I could see it again. Your grief for your brother is deeply touching, said Lindian. But I still do not understand what happened. That is because your eyes were on Rodiel. For myself, I cannot, <coughs> could not stomach the man. Therefore, I watched Shano. He drew his gun as he spoke. There was no sharp movement, and the weapon was almost clear before Rodiel realized he was in peril. But surely Rodiel must have known Shano would attempt to fight. Of course, but that is where timing is all important. He asked Shano a question and was waiting for a response. How many times have we both done exactly that? It has never mattered, because we dealt with sword and knife. But these guns, they are sudden. Rodiel expected conversation, fear, nervousness, even pleading or flight. Shano merely killed him. Lindian nodded. You guessed, didn't you? You expected this? I did. <laughs> but the outcome was beyond my greatest hopes. It is the guns, Lindian. We can master their uses with ease, but not the great changes they create in man-to-man -man battles. It's what I tried to say earlier. With the sword, the lance, or the mace, battle becomes ritualized. Opponents must circle one another, seeking openings, risking their lives. It all takes time. But the gun, a fraction of a heartbeat, separates man from corpse. 
Shano understands this. He's lived all his life with such weapons. There is no need for ritual or concepts of honour. An enemy is there to be shot down and forgotten. He will light no candles for Rodiel. Then how do we tackle him? We cannot kill him from ambush. We must face him. He will show us his weakness, Lindian. Tonight we will enter his dreams, and they will give us the key. Shano and Nu made their camp in the lee of a hill. The Jerusalem man said little and moved away to sit alone, staring at the city they would visit in the morning. His mood was dark and somber. A long time ago he told Donna Tabard, Each death lessens me, lady. But was it still true? The execution of Weber had been a first, an unarmed man made to stand, humiliated in front of his peers, and then gunned down. The other man in the crowd had done nothing but speak. For that he too was dead. What separates you from the brigand now, Chano? There was no answer. He was older, slower, more reliant on skill than speed. And worse, he had cocooned himself within his reputation, allowing the legend to awe lesser men into bending to his will. For what? he whispered. Is the world a better place? Is Jerusalem any closer? He thought back to the white-haired young man who had accosted them on the trail. Was that a duel? he asked himself. No, it was murder. The young warrior had no chance. You could have waited and met him on equal terms. Why? Honor? Fair play? Why not? You used to believe in such virtues? He rubbed at his tired eyes as Nu strode over to him. Do you wish to remain alone? I will be alone whether you join me or not. <laughs> but sit anyway. Talk of it, Shano. Let the words bring out the bile inside. There is no bile. I was thinking about the hunter. Yes, he was Rodiel, and he had killed many. I was surprised at the ease with which you sent him to the grave. Yes, it was easy. They're all easy. Yet it troubles you. Sometimes in the dark of night. I killed a child once. Ended his life by mistake. He troubles me. He haunts my dreams. I've killed so many men, and it is all becoming so easy. God did not make man to be alone, Shano. Think on it. Oh, you think I have not? I tried once to settle down, but I knew before I lost her that it was not for me. I'm not a man made for happiness. I carry such guilt over that child, Nu. Not guilt, my friend. Grief. There is a difference. Yours is a skill I would not wish to acquire. Yet it is necessary. In my own time there were wild tribes bordering our lands. They would raid and kill. Pendaric destroyed them, and we all slept easier in our beds. As long as man remains the hunter-killer, there will be a need for warriors like you. I can wear my white robes and pray in peace. The evil can dress in black. But there must always be the grey riders to patrol the border between good and evil. We're playing with words, Nu. No. Grey is only a lighter shade of black. Or a darker shade of white. You're not evil, Shano. You are plagued by self-doubt. That is what saves you. That is where the parson is in peril. He has no doubts, and therefore is capable of enormous evil. It was the downfall of Pendaric. No, you are safe, Grey Rider. Safe, repeated Shanna. Who is safe? He who walks with God. How long since you sought his word in your Bible? Too long. Nu stretched out his hand, holding Shenno's leather-covered Bible. No man of God should be lonely.
Shano took the book. Maybe I should have devoted myself to a life of prayer. You have followed the path set for you. God uses both warrior and priest, and it is not for us to judge his purposes. Read a little, then sleep. I will pray for you, Shano. Pray for the dead, my friend. As the horse reared and died, Shano leapt from the saddle. He hit the ground hard, rolled, and came to his knees with guns in hand. The roaring of his pistols and the screams of his attackers faded. A sound from behind. Shano swiveled and fired. The boy was hurled from his feet. A small dog began yapping. It ran to the boy, licking his dead face. What a vile man you are! came a voice, and Shano blinked and turned. Two young men stood close by, their hair white, their eyes cold. It was an accident, said Shano. I was being attacked. I didn't realize. A child killer, Lindian. What should we do with him? He deserves to die, said the smaller of the two. There is no question of that. I never meant to kill the child, Shano repeated. The tall man in the black and silver tunic stepped forward, his hand hovering over the gun butt. The King of Kings has spoken the words of your death, John Shano. Do you have anything to say before you die? No, said Shano, palming his pistol smoothly. A bullet smashed into Shano's chest, the pain incredible as his own gun dropped from his twitching fingers and he sank to his knees. You should not try the same trick twice, old man, whispered his killer. Shano died, and awoke beside the fire on the hillside. Nu was sleeping soundly beside him. The night breeze was cool. Shano built up the fire and returned to his blankets. He was standing at the centre of an arena. Seated all around him were men he had killed. Sorrento, Weber, Thomas, Lomax, and so many others whose names he could not remember. The child was leaning back on a golden throne, blood dripping steadily to stain the breast of the white tunic he wore. "'These are your judges, John Shannow,' said a voice, and the tall, white-haired warrior stepped forward. "'These are the souls of the slain.' "'They are evil men,' stated Shannow. "'Why should they have the right to judge me?' "'What gave you the right to judge them?' "'By their deeds,' answered the Jerusalem man." And what was his crime? stormed his accuser, pointing to the blood-drenched child. It was a mistake, an error. And what price have you paid for that error, John Shano? Every day I have paid a price for the fire in my soul. And what price for these? shouted the warrior, as down the central aisle came a score of children, some black, some white, toddlers and infants, young boys and girls. I do not know them. This is trickery, said Shano. They were the children of the Guardians, drowned when you destroyed the Titanic. What price for these, Shano? I am not an evil man, shouted the Jerusalem man. By your deeds we judge you. Shano saw the warrior reach for his pistol. His own gun flashed up. But at the moment he fired, the man disappeared, and the bullet smashed into the chest of the boy on the throne. Oh, dear God, not again! screamed the Jerusalem man. His body jerked, and he came awake instantly. Beyond the fire sat a lioness and her cubs. As he sat up, the lioness growled and moved back, the cubs scampering after her. Shano banked up the fire, and Nu awoke and stretched. Did you sleep well? he asked. Let's pack up and move on, Shano answered. As always, when the parson needed to pray in solitude, he headed for the high country, bordering the clouds. His route took him through the woods of the bear people, but he cared nothing for danger. A man on his way to speak with his maker, he knew that nothing would keep him from that appointment. His soul was heavy, for the people had rejected him. He should have expected that, he knew, for it was always the way with prophets— did they not reject Elijah, Elisha, Samuel? Did they not spurn the Son of God himself? The people were weak, thinking only of their bellies or their small needs. Just like the monastery, with their constant prayers and works of little good. 
The world is evil, the abbot had told him. We must turn our faces from it and seek the greater glory of God through worship. But God made the world abbot, and Jesus himself asked us to go among the people as he used to do. No, he did not, the abbot answered. He asked his disciples to do that. But this is Armageddon. These are the end days. The people are not for saving. They have made their choices. He'd left the monastery and taken a meager living in a mining town, preaching in a bell-shaped tent. But the devil had come to him there and found him wanting. Lucifer had led the girl to his sermon, and Lucifer had put the carnal thoughts in her mind. Oh, he had fought the desires of the flesh. But how weak is man! His people, not understanding his temptations, nor the inner battles that went with them, had driven him from the town. It was not his fault. It was God's judgment when the girl hanged herself. The parson shook his head and looked around him, realizing he'd come deep into the woods. He saw the dismembered body of a reptile, then another. Drawing the horse to a halt, he looked around. Bodies lay everywhere. He dismounted and saw that by a bush, her corpse wedged beneath the jutting roots of an old oak, lay Sharazad. There were terrible rips and tears on her body, but her face was remarkably untouched. Shanna was right, said the parson. You do look like an angel. By her hand lay a red-veined stone, and he lifted it. It was warm and soothing to the touch. He dropped it into the pocket of his black cassock and mounted his horse, but his hand seemed to miss the warmth of the stone, and he drew it out once more. He rode on, ever rising, until he came out onto a clearing at the crest of the range. It was cold here, but the air was fresh and clean, the sky unbearably blue. Dismounting once more, he knelt in prayer. Dear father, he began, lead me to the paths of righteousness. Take my body and soul. Show me the road I must walk to do your work. Fulfill your word. The stone grew hot in his hand and his mind blurred. A golden face appeared before him, bearded and stern, pale-eyed and regal. The parson's heart began to hammer. "'Who calls on me?' came a voice in the parson's mind. "'My lord, the humblest of your servants,' the parson whispered, falling forward and pressing his face to the ground. Miraculously, the image remained before him, as if his eyes were still open. Open your mind to me, said the voice. I do not know how. Hold the stone to your breast. The parson did so. Warmth enveloped him, and for a while there was peace and serenity. Then the glow faded, and he felt alone once more. You have sinned greatly, my son, said Penderick. How will you cleanse yourself? I will do anything, Lord. Mount your horse and ride a little way to the east. There you will find the survivors of the reptiles. You will lift the stone and say to them, Pandaric, they will follow you and do your bidding. But they're creatures of the devil, Lord. Yes, but I will give them the opportunity to redeem their souls. Go to the city, enter the temple, then call for me again, and I will guide you. But what of the great whore? She must be destroyed. Do not seek to contradict me, thundered Pendaric. In my own time will I bring her down. Go to the temple, Nicodemus. Seek out the scrolls of gold hidden beneath the altar. But if the whore tries to prevent me, then kill her and any who stand with her. Yes, Lord, as you bid. And the sword. We will speak again when you have accomplished your mission. The face faded. The parson rose. All his anguish left him, 
At last he had found his god. Chapter 30 Back at her cabin, Beth was happily surprised to find no damage from the earthquakes. In the fields below, there were still pits and chasms, and several trees had fallen. But on the flat ledge of the hillside, where Bull had chosen to place the macadam home, there was no evidence of movement at all. The sandy-haired rider grinned at Beth. "'If you say I told you so, Bull, I'll crack your skull,' Beth said to him. "'Me? The thought never crossed my mind.' He tethered his horse and helped Beth carry the wounded Steiner into the house. "'I can walk, damn it,' Steiner grumbled. "'I ain't having no stitches opening again,' Beth told him. "'Now, keep quiet.' Bull and the children manhandled the furniture from the wagon, while Beth fueled the iron stove and set a pot of bakers to simmer. As dusk stained the sky, Bull rose. "'Must be getting back to Mania Skazy,' he said. I reckon there'll be enough to do there. You want me to bring you anything tomorrow? If there's anything left in the town, I wouldn't mind some salt. I'll fetch it. And some dried beef. You're looking mighty low on stores. I'm short on part of coin, Bull. I'll have to owe you. You do that, he said. She watched him ride off and shook her head, allowing a smile to show. Now, he wouldn't make a bad husband, she thought. He's caring, strong, and he likes the kids. But the face of John Shano cut across the smiling image of Bull. Damn you for a fool, Shano, whispered Beth. Samuel and Mary were sitting by the stove, Samuel's head resting against the wall, his eyes closed. Beth walked to him, lifting him from his feet. His eyes opened, and his head dropped to her shoulder. "'It's bed for you, snapper gut, she said, carrying him into the back room and laying him down. She didn't bother to strip his clothes, but removing his shoes, she covered him with a blanket. Mary came in behind her. "'I'm not tired, Mar. Can I sit up for a while?' Beth looked into the child's puffy eyes. "'You can snuggle in next to your brother, and if you're still awake in an hour, you can sit with me.' Mary grinned sheepishly and climbed under the blanket. She was asleep within minutes. Beth returned to the main room and lit the fire, then walked out onto the porch where Bull had erected a bench seat made from a split log, planed and polished. She sat back and stared over the moonlit valley. The wall was down everywhere, although some sections still reared like broken teeth. She shivered. Nice night, observed Steiner, limping out to sit beside her. His face was pale, dark rings staining the skin beneath his eyes. You're a damn fool, said Beth. And you're as pretty as a picture under moonlight, he told her. Except for the nose, she replied. And it's no good making up to me, Clem Steiner. Even if I let you, it would kill you for certain. There's truth in that, he admitted. Beth continued to stare at the horizon. What are you thinking? he asked. I was thinking about Shano. Not that it's any of your business. You in love with him? You're a prying sort of fellow, Steiner. And you are, then. You could do worse, I guess. Except I don't see you travelling the world looking for some city that don't exist. You're right. "'Maybe I should marry you.' "'That's not a bad thought, Frey McAdam,' he responded, smiling. "'I can be right good company.' "'You've been hiding that light under a bushel,' she said sharply. He chuckled. "'Come to think of it, that is a pretty big nose.' She laughed, and her tension eased. Clem stretched his wounded leg out in front of him and rubbed at it. "'Does Shanna know how you feel?' he asked, his voice low and serious. Beth cut off a sharp retort. I told him, in a way, but he won't change. He's like you. I've changed, he said. I don't want to be a pistol ear. I couldn't give a damn about reputations. I had a father who beat the hell out of me. He said I've never make anything of my life, and I guess I've been trying to prove him wrong. 
Now I don't care about that no more. What will you do? I'll find a nice woman. I'll raise kids and corn. There's some hope for you yet, Clem Steiner. He was about to answer when he spotted two riders angling up towards the house. Strange-looking pair, said Beth. Look how the moonlight makes their hair seem white. Shanno was ill at ease as they rode. The dreams had unnerved him, but worse than that, he had the constant feeling he was being watched. Time and again he would turn in the saddle and study the skyline, or alter the direction in which they travelled, dismounting before the crest of every hill. But now the city was ahead of them, and still the feeling would not pass. "'What is troubling you?' Nu asked. "'We should have been at the city hours ago.' "'I don't know,' admitted Shano. "'I feel uncomfortable.' No more than I feel perched on this horse, responded Nu. A rabbit darted across their path, and Shano's gun swept up. He cursed softly, then flicked the stallion's flanks with his heels. The city was protected by a great wall, but the recent earthquakes had scored it with cracks. There were no gates, but as they entered the city, Shano could see deep holes in the stones where hinges had once been placed. The gates, Nu told him, were of wood and bronze, emblazoned with the head of a lion, and this entrance would take you through the streets of silversmiths and on to the sculptor's quarter. My home was close by. People in the streets stopped and stared at the riders. There was no animosity here, only curious gazes. There were more women than men, Shannon noticed, and they were tall and well-formed. Their clothes mainly hide, beautifully embroidered. He halted his horse. I seek the dark lady, he said, removing his hat and bowing. The nearest woman smiled and pointed to the east. She is in the high tower with Oshiri, she answered. God's peace upon you, Shannon told her. The law of the one be with you she replied. The horse's hooves clattered on the cobbled street. In my time, no beasts were allowed into this quarter, said Nu. The residents found the smell of manure less than appealing. A bent and crippled shape loomed before them, and Shano's mind was hurled back to Shiran. His stallion reared, but he calmed it with soft words. The man-beast ambled past, not able to lift his huge, misshapen head. "'Poor soul,' said Nu, as they walked their horses on. The street widened into a statue-lined road that stretched, arrow straight, towards a tall palace of white marble. "'Penderick's summer home,' explained Nu. "'It also houses the temple.' The road ended at a colossal stairway, more than a hundred paces wide, slowly rising to an enormous archway. "'The steps of the king,' said Nu. Like the road, the steps were lined with statues, each one carved from marble and each bearing a sword and a scepter. Shano urged on the stallion and rode the steps. Nu dismounted and led the mare after him. As the Jerusalem man reached the archway, a slender black woman moved from the shadows to greet him. Shano recalled the moment he had first seen her, carrying her son from the wreck of the resurrected Titanic. Amaziga, you are the dark lady, he said, as he climbed down from the saddle. The same, Shano. What are you doing here? He noted the tension in her voice, the lack of warmth in her eyes. Am I such an unwelcome visitor? There are no evils here for you to slay. I promise you that. I'm not here to kill. Do you think me such a villain? Then tell me why you are here. Shanna saw a movement behind her deep in the shadows of the archway. A young man appeared. Once he must have been strikingly handsome, but now his face was distended and his shoulders bowed. Guiltily, Shano averted his eyes from the man's deformities. "'I asked you a question, Shano,' said Amaziga Archer. "'I came to warn you of impending perils, and also to see the sword of God. 
but it would be pleasant if we could talk inside somewhere. Nu reached the archway, saw Amaziga, and bowed low. This is my companion, Nu Kezizatra. He is from Atlantis, Amaziga, and I think you should hear what he has to say. Follow me, she said, turning on her heel and striding back through the archway. The deformed man followed her silently, Nu and Shano bringing up the rear. They found themselves in a wide, square courtyard. Amaziga crossed it, passed a circular fountain, and continued on through a huge hallway. Shano tethered his stallion and Nu's mare in the courtyard and entered the building. It was ghostly quiet within, and their footsteps created eerie echoes. They mounted a long circular staircase and emerged into a room where Amaziga had already seated herself behind a mahogany desk, on which were scattered papers, scrolls, and books. She looked younger than Shano remembered, but her eyes seemed full of sorrow. "'Say what you want to say, Jerusalem man, then leave us in whatever peace remains.' Shano took a deep breath, stilling the rise of anger he felt. Slowly he told her of the attack on the township of Pilgrim's Valley, and their flight beyond the fractured wall. He spoke of the woman, Sharazad, and the parson, and the fears that she was some evil goddess. And he told her of Pendarek. She listened without comment, but her interest grew when Nu began his tale. She questioned him sharply, but his soft-spoken answers seemed to satisfy her. At last, when both men had finished, she asked the deformed man to fetch some drink. Neither Shano nor Nu had stared at him, and after he had gone, Amaziga fixed her eyes on the Jerusalem man. "'Do you know what is happening to him?' she asked. "'He is turning into a lion,' Shano answered, holding her gaze. "'How did you know?' I met a man named Shiran, who suffered the same horror. He rescued me, gave me aid when I needed it, healed my wounds. What happened to him? He died. I said, what happened to him? Amaziga snapped. I killed him, said Shano. Her eyes grew cold and her smile chilled new. Now that has a familiar ring, Shanu. After all, how many stories are there concerning that Jerusalem man when he doesn't kill something or someone? Have you destroyed any communities lately? I did not destroy your home base. Sorrento did that when he sailed the Titanic. I merely blocked the power of the Mother Stone. But I will not argue with you, lady, nor debate my deeds. I will leave now and seek the sword. You must not, Shano. You must not go near it. The words hissed from her. You do not understand. I understand that the gateway between past and present must be closed. Perhaps the sword of God will close it. If not, when the disaster befalls Atlantis, we could be dragged down with it. The sword of God is not the answer you seek. Believe me. I will not know until I've seen it, Shano told her. Amaziga's hand came up from below the desk, and in it was held a hell-born pistol. She cocked it and pointed the barrel at Shano. You will promise me to stay away from the sword, or you will die here, she said. Quina, came a voice from the doorway. Stop it. Put the pistol away. You don't understand, O Sherry. Stay out of this. I understand enough, said the man-beast, moving clumsily forward and placing the silver tray on the desk. His deformed hand closed over the pistol, gently removing it from her grasp. Nothing you have told me about this bad suggests he is evil. Why would you wish to harm him? Death follows wherever he rides. Destruction. I can feel it, Oshiri. She stood and ran from the room, and Oshiri laid the pistol on the desk. Shano leaned forward and uncocked it. Oshiri eased himself into the chair Amaziga had used, his dark eyes fixed on the Jerusalem man. She is under great strain, Shano, he said. 
She thought she had found a way to cure me, but it was only a temporary respite. Now she must suffer again. She loved my brother, Shiran, and he became a beast. Now, he shrugged, now it is my turn. Your arrival made her distraught, but she will gather her strength and consider what you have said. Now, have some wine and rest. I will see your horses are taken to a field nearby where there is good grass. Through that door you will find beds and blankets. There is no time to rest, said Nu. The end is near. I can feel it. Shanno pushed himself wearily to his feet. I had hoped for aid. I thought the Dark Lady would be a person of power. She is, Shanno, Osheri assured him. She has great knowledge. Give her time. You heard Nu. There is no time. We will ride on to the sword, but first Nu needs to search the temple's sanctuary. Why? Oshiri asked. There could be something there that will help me to return home, Nu told him. The sound of gunshots came from close by, followed by screams of terror. You see? shouted Amaziga Archer from the doorway, pointing at Shano. Where he rides, death always follows. Chapter 31 The parson rode boldly into the clearing where twenty-three survivors of the Daggers Force had gathered. Several were wounded, their scaled limbs bound. Others were keeping watch, rifles poised, for any attack from the bears. Holding the bloodstone high, the parson guided his mount in amongst his enemies and voiced the single word that his god had commanded him. Pandaric, he said, as rifles were aimed at his chest. The guns were lowered instantly. Follow me, ordered the parson, riding from the clearing. The reptiles took up their weapons, formed two lines, and marched out behind his horse. The parson was exultant. How mysterious are the ways of the Lord, he told the morning air, and how great are his wonders. On the plain before the city, lions gathered in great numbers, padding forward to stand in the parson's path. He lifted his stone. Give way, he bellowed. A black-maned beast reared up in pain, then ran to the left. The others followed it, leaving a path through which the parson healed his mount. He led the reptiles to the northern gateway and then turned in the saddle. All who resist the will of God must die, he declared. Confident that the awesome power of the Creator was with him, he entered the gateway. Beyond it he saw many people. None stood in his way. They gazed with frank, open curiosity as the marching reptiles and the parson rode on through white-walled streets. A young woman with a child stood close by, holding the toddler's hand. "'The temple,' inquired the parson. "'How shall I reach it?' The woman pointed to a high-domed building, and he approached it. The temple pillars were massive and close-set. He dismounted and walked up the long stairway with the reptiles behind him. An old man moved out to stand before him. "'Who seeks the wisdom of the law of one?' he asked. Step aside for the warrior of God, the parson told him. You cannot enter, replied the old man pleasantly. The priests are at prayer. When the sun touches the western wall, then may your entreaties be heard. Out of my way, old man, the parson ordered, drawing his pistol. Do you not understand, asked the high priest, it is not allowed. A shot echoed in the temple corridors, and the high priest fell back without a sound, blood pumping from a hole in his brow. The parson ran into the temple, the reptiles swarming after him. Taking their new master's lead, they began firing on the priests inside, who ran for shelter. 
Ignoring the carnage, the parson scanned the building, seeking the inner sanctum. There was a narrow doorway at the end of the long hall, and he ran to it, kicking it open. Within was an altar, and another old man was hastily gathering scrolls of gold foil. He looked up and struggled to rise, but the pistol bucked in the parson's hand and he fell. The parson knelt by the scrolls and lifted his stone. "'Hear me, Lord. I have done your bidding.' Pendarek's face shimmered before him. "'The scrolls,' he said. "'Read them.' The parson lifted a section of gold foil and unrolled it. "'I cannot make out the symbols,' he said. "'I can. Discard that one. Take another.' One by one the parson opened the foils, his eyes scanning the curious stick-like symbols. At last, when he had finished, he looked into the eyes of God and saw they were troubled. "'What must I do, Lord?' he whispered. Bring the sword of God to the earth, Pendarek told him. Today, there is a peak to the south. Climb it, but first lay your stone upon the body of the priest beside you. Place it on his blood. There it will gather strength. When you have climbed the peak, lift the stone and call upon the sword. Bring it to you. You understand? Yes, answered the parson. Oh, yes, my dream's fulfilled. Thank you, Lord. What then must I do? We will speak again when you have obeyed me. The face disappeared. The parson laid his stone on the bleeding chest of the priest, watching as the blood seemed to flow into it, swelling its veins. Then he took it once more and rose. From outside came the sound of more gunshots. He ran through the hallway, down the steps, and leapt to his horse. Ignoring the reptiles, he galloped back to the main gateway and on to fulfill God's wishes. Shano ran from the room when the first shot sounded, pushing past Amaziga and taking the steps two at a time. The courtyard was deserted, save for the two horses tethered there. More shots came from the temple building, and Shano drew his pistols and advanced across the courtyard. A reptile ran into view with a rifle in his hands. As Shano's pistol came up, the reptile spotted him and swung his weapon to bear. Shano's gun fired. The creature spun back into the wall and fell to his face on the stones. The Jerusalem man waited for several seconds, watching the entrances, but no other reptiles came in sight. He ducked past the fountain and ran across the open space to the rear of the temple, where a wooden door blocked his access. Lifting his foot, he crashed it against the lock, and the door burst inwards. A shot splintered the wood of the frame as he dived through and rolled to his left. Bullets hissed and whined around him, ricocheting from the mosaic floor. As he came to his knees behind a pillar, he heard the sound of running feet from his right. Twisting, he leveled his pistols. Three reptiles died. He watched the parson run from a doorway to the left. Two daggers moved aside to let him pass, and Shano killed them both. A shell tore through the collar of his coat, and he returned the fire, but missed. Then he was up and running for a second pillar as bullets hissed by him. A dagger ran into his path with knife raised. Shano shot twice into the beast's body. All around the reptiles were running for the great doorway. Silence fell within the temple as Shano reloaded his pistols and stood. Amaziga appeared in the doorway, Nu and Oshiri with her, and ran to the room Shano had seen the parson emerge from. The Jerusalem man returned his guns to their scabbards and followed them. Within the small chamber, Nu was kneeling with Amaziga beside a dying priest. He was old, white-bearded, and his chest was stained with blood. "'I am the leaf,' whispered the priest, as Nu lifted his head and cradled him. "'God is the tree,' Nu responded softly. "'The circle is complete,' said the man. "'Now I will know the law of the one, the circle of God.' "'Now you will know,' said Nu. 
The streams flow into the rivers, the rivers into the sea, the sea into the clouds, the clouds into the streams, the rich earth into the tree, the tree to the leaf, the leaf to the earth. All life forms the circle of God. The dying priest smiled. You are a believer. I am glad. Your circle goes on. What did they want? What did they take? asked Amaziga. Nothing, answered the priest. He read the sacred scrolls and summoned a demon. The demon told him to bring the sword of God to earth. No, Amaziga whispered. It is of no matter, Krina, said the priest, his voice fading. His head fell back in New's arms. The shipbuilder gently lowered the body to the floor and rose. They were fine words, Shano told him. They are part of the writings of the One. There is perfection only in the circle, Shano. To understand that is to understand God. Nu smiled and began to walk around the chamber, searching the carved walls, studying each projection. Shano joined him. What do you seek? I am not sure. The stones would have been kept in this room, but I have no idea where. Only the high priest knew, and he passed the knowledge to his successor. The room was small and square, though the altar was circular. The limestone walls were splendidly sculpted, graceful figures with painted eyes and long, tapering hands that reached for the sky. Shano walked to the altar and stood gazing down on the flat, polished surface. Engraved there, and filled with gold leaf, was a wondrous tree with golden leaves. He ran his fingers lightly over the surface, tracing the branches. The design was beautiful and restful to the eye. Around the rim of the altar, birds were carved, some in flight, some nesting, others feeding their young. Again the principle was the circle from the egg to the sky. His fingers traced over the carvings, resting at last on the nest and the single egg. It moved under his fingers, and taking a firm grip, he lifted the egg clear. It was small and perfectly white. But once in his hand, it became warm, the color growing from white to cream to yellow and finally to gold. I have what you seek, he said, and Nu came to him and took the golden egg from his palm. Yes, Nu agreed, his voice low. You have indeed. The stone from heaven, said Oshiri, wondrous. What will you do now? It is not mine to take, replied Nu. But if it were, I would return to my land and try to save my wife and children from the coming cataclysm. Then take it, Oshiri told him. No, cried Amaziga, I need it. You need it. I cannot watch you change again. Oshiri turned away from her. I... Wish you to have the stone, Nu Kazizatra. I am a prince of the Dianai. The high priest is dead, and I have the right to bestow the stone. Take it. Use it well. Let me have it, just for a moment, pleaded Amaziga. Let me make Oshiri well again. No, Oshiri shouted. The Sipstrasi will not work against itself, you have seen that. It made me what I am. The power is too great to waste on a man like me. Can you not understand that, Krina? I am a lion who walks like a man. Even magic cannot change what I am, what I will become. It does not matter, Krina. You and I, we will see the ocean, and that is all I want. 
What about what I want? she asked him. I love you, Ashiri. <sighs> and I love you, Dark Lady, more than life. I always will. But nothing is forever, not even love. He turned to Nu. How will you find your way home? There is a circle of stones beyond what was once the royal gardens. I shall go there. I will walk with you, said Oshiri, and the three men left the chamber. Amaziga stayed beside the dead priest, staring at the golden scrolls. The circle of stones had been largely untouched by the centuries, though one had cracked and fallen. Nu walked to the center of the circle and offered his hand to Shano. I learned much, my friend, he said, yet I did not discover the sword of God as I was commanded. I'll find it, Nu, and do what needs to be done. You find your family. Farewell, Shano. God's love be with you. Shano and Ashiri walked out of the circle, and Nu lifted the stone and cried out in a language Shano could not understand. There was no flash of light, no drama. One moment he was there, the next he was gone. Shano felt a sense of loss as he turned to Ashiri. You're a man of courage, he said. No, Shano. I wish that I were, but Sipstrasi has made me what I am. Krina used the magic of the stones to reshape me, but almost immediately I began to revert. Oh, she is a stubborn woman, and she would use all the stones in the world to hold me. Such a gift from God should not be wasted in that way. The two men walked slowly back to the temple. Crowds had now gathered, and the bodies of the slain priests were being carried from the building. Why did they not fight? asked Shano. There were so few of the enemy. We are not warriors, Shano. We do not believe in murder. Inside the temple, Amazika joined them, her face set and hard. We must talk, Shano. Excuse us, Oshiri. She led the Jerusalem man back into the inner sanctum. The priest's body was gone, but blood still stained the floor. Amaziga swung on him. You must follow the killer and stop him. It is vital. Why? What harm can he do? The sword must be left as it is. I still do not see why. If it serves God's purposes, God, Shano, God has nothing to do with the sword. Sword? What am I saying? It is not a sword, Shano. It is a missile, a nuclear missile, a flying bomb. Then the parson will blow himself to hell. Why concern yourself? He will blow us all to hell. You have no conception of the power of that missile, Shano. It will destroy everything that you could see from the tower. For two hundred miles the earth will be scorched and laid bare. Can you comprehend that? Explain it to me. Amaziga took a deep breath, trying to marshal her words. As a guardian and a teacher, her memory had been enhanced by Sibstrasi, and she could summon all the facts concerning the missile, yet none of them would serve to help her explain it to Shano. It was an MX missile experimental, length 34.3 meters, diameter 225 centimeters at first stage, speed 18,000 miles per hour at burnout, range 14,000 kilometers, yield 10 times 350 kilotons, 10 warheads, each with the capacity to destroy a city. How could she explain that to an Armageddon savage? In the between times, Shano, there was great fear and hatred. Men built awesome weapons, and one was used on a city during a terrible war. 
It destroyed the city utterly. Hundreds of thousands of people were killed by that single blast. But soon the bombs were made even more powerful, and great rockets were constructed that could carry the bombs from one continent to another. How did the nation survive? They didn't, Shano, she said simply. And these bombs caused the earth to topple. Not exactly, but that is not important. The parson must not be allowed to interfere with the missile. Why does it stand in the sky? Why is it surrounded by crosses, if not from God? he asked. Come back to my rooms, and I will tell you as best as I can. I do not have all the answers. But promise me, Shano, that when I have explained it to you, you will ride to stop him. I will decide that when you have explained it all. He followed her to her chambers and sat down opposite her desk. You know, she said, that this land was once below the oceans. Where we are now was once an area of sea known as the Devil's Triangle. It acquired that name because of the unexplained disappearances of ships and planes. You understand about planes? No. Men used to... It was discovered that it was possible for machines to take to the skies. They were called planes. They had wide wings and engines that propelled them at great speeds through the air. What you will see clustered in the sky around the sword are not crucifixes or crosses, but planes. They are trapped in some sort of stasis field. Oh, dear God, Shano, this is impossible. She poured a goblet of wine from the pitcher on her desk and drank deeply. Then she leaned forward. The Atlanteans used the power of a great Sipstrasi stone and aimed it at the sky. Why, I do not know, but they did it. When Atlantis sank beneath the oceans, the power of the stone continued. It trapped more than a hundred planes and ships. It would have been more, but the field was very narrow. The power has been decreasing over the years, and the ships fell to earth. You can still find their ruined hulks out on the desert beyond the Chaos Peak. How it trapped the missile, I can only guess. When the earth toppled for a second time, there were massive earthquakes. But then the weapon centers were run by computers and they probably registered the enormous earthquakes as nuclear strikes and responded. That's why the levels of radiation are still so high over most of the world. The earth toppled, missiles were released, and any opportunity of salvaging some remnants of civilization was gone. This missile was probably fired from somewhere in a country called America. It crossed the stasis field and has remained there for three hundred years. But surely the between-timers would have seen, as we do, the planes hanging in the air. If they had such great weapons, why did they not destroy the stone? I don't think they could see the planes. I think the Sipstrasi was originally programmed to hold the objects in another dimension, invisible to us. Only when the power began to drain did they become visible. Shano shook his head. I did not understand any of this, Amaziga. It is beyond me. Planes, stasis fields, computers... But I've been having strange dreams lately. I am sitting in a crystal bubble inside a giant cross high in the sky. There is a voice whispering in my ear. It is someone called Tower, and he is telling me to assume a bearing due west. My voice, and yet not my voice, tells him we do not know which way is west. Everything is wrong. 
Strange. Even the ocean does not look as it should. The crystal bubble, Shano, is the cockpit of a plane, and the voice you heard was not from someone called Tower, but the Control Tower in a place called Fort Lauderdale. And the voice that was yours, and yet not yours, was that of Lieutenant Charles Taylor, flying one of five Navy Avenger torpedo bombers on a train in Rome. You can still see them in formation close to the missile. Trust me, Shano. Stop the parson. He rose. I don't know that I can, but I will try, he told her. Chapter 32 Beth McAdam awoke with her head pounding, her body sore. She sat up and saw the two men who had dragged her from her cabin. Grabbing a rock, she pushed herself to her feet. You slimy sons of bitches, she hissed. The taller of the men rose smoothly to his feet and moved towards her. Her hand flew up, with a rock poised to smash his temple, but he blocked the blow with ease and backhanded her to the ground. Do not seek to annoy me, he said. His hair was chalk-white, his face young and unlined. He knelt beside her. You will come to no harm. You have the promise of Magellus. We merely need you to help us to complete a mission. My children? They are unharmed. And the man Lindian struck was only unconscious. There was no lasting damage. What is this mission? she asked, tensing herself for a second attack. Do not be foolish, he advised her. If you choose to be troublesome, I'll break both your arms. Beth let the rock fall from her fingers. You asked about our mission, he continued, smiling. We are sent to dispatch John Shano. He holds you in some esteem, and he will give himself up to us in return for your safety. In a pig's eye, she retorted, he'll kill you both. I do not think so. I've come to know John Shano, to respect him, even to like him. He will surrender himself. If you like him, how can you think of killing him? What has emotion to do with duty? <laughs> the king, my father, says Shano must die. Then he will die. Why don't you just face him, like men? Magellus chuckled. And we are executioners, not duelists. Had I been instructed to face him on equal terms, then I would have done so, as would my brother Lindian. But it is not necessary, and therefore would constitute a foolish risk. Now we will proceed with or without your willing help. But I do not wish to break your arms. Will you help us? Your children need you, Beth McAdam. What do you want me to say? That you will stay with us and not try any more foolishness with rocks. We don't have a lot of choices, do I? Say the words anyway. It'll make me feel more relaxed. I'll do as you say. That good enough for you? It will suffice. We have prepared some food and it would be our pleasure if you joined us for a meal. Where are we? Beth asked. We are sitting in one of your holy places, I believe, answered Magellus, pointing to the star-filled sky. Several hundred feet above them, glistening silver in the moonlight, hung the sword of God. Amaziga Archer sat alone after Shano had gone. On her desk now were the sacred scrolls guarded by the Dianae. Her husband, Samuel, had spent four years teaching her the meaning of the symbols, which resembled the cuneiform writings of ancient Mesopotamia. For the main part, the gold foils were covered with astrological notes and charts of star systems. But the last three, including one missed by the parson, contained the thoughts of the astrologer Araxis. Amaziga read the words of the first two and shivered. There was much here that was beyond her, but it tallied with ancient legends concerning the doom of Atlantis. 
They had found a great power source, but had misused it, and the oceans had risen up, the continent being buried beneath the waves. Now Amaziga understood. In opening the gates of time, they'd altered the delicate balance of gravity. Instead of spinning contentedly around the sun, the earth was exposed to the gravitational pull of a second sun, and perhaps more. The earthquakes and volcanic eruptions outlined in Araxus's scrolls were merely indications of a tortured world, pulled in opposing directions and teetering on its axis. The earthquakes now were exactly the same. With two colossal suns in the sky, the gravitation drag was causing the planet to tremble. Shano was right. The imminent fall of Atlantis represented a deadly danger to the New World. One of the great mysteries the Guardians had never been able to solve was the eyewitness accounts of the Second Fall, when ten thousand years of civilization were ripped from the surface of the planet. Those eyewitnesses had spoken of two suns in the sky. Amaziga had been educated in the theory that what had been seen was, in fact, a nuclear explosion. Now she was not so sure. The gold scrolls spoke of a gateway to a world of flying machines and great weapons. The circle of history? When Atlantis fell, did it drag the twenty-first century with it? And what of the twenty-fourth? What of now? Dear God! Was the earth to fall again? The dust breeze was cold against her skin. Rising, she drew the heavy curtains and lit the lanterns on the wall. What is it about our race, she wondered, that leads us always along the road of destruction? Returning to her desk, she picked up the last scroll and traced the words under the dim, golden light of the lanterns. Her eyes widened. Sweet! Jesus, she whispered, and taking her pistol, she ran from the room and down the stairs to the courtyard. News mare was still tethered there, and she climbed into the saddle and raced through the city. Beyond the main gate, the lions were feasting on the bodies of the reptiles. They ignored her, and she lashed the mare into a gallop. Shano did not follow the parson at speed. The stallion was weary and in need of rest— also, the light was failing, and he knew he would be too late if any mishap should befall the horse. The Jerusalem man swayed in the saddle. He also was tired. His mind reeled with all that Amaziga had told him. Once upon a time, the world had been a simple place, where there were good men and evil men, and the hope of Jerusalem. Now all had changed. The sword of God was just a weapon created by men to destroy other men. The crown of crosses was planes from out of the past. So where was God? Shano lifted his water canteen and drank deeply. Far ahead he could see the outline of the Chaos Peak. As the clouds parted, he saw the sword, glittering like silver in the night sky. "'Where are you, Lord?' said Shano. "'Where do you walk?' There was no answer. Shano thought of Nu, and hoped the shipbuilder had returned home safely. The stallion plodded on, and dawn was breaking as Shano angled his mount up the rocky slope leading to the Chaos Peak and the Pledging Pool. Glancing back, he could see in the distance a rider coming towards the peak. Taking his long glass— he focused it and recognized Amaziga. The mare was all but finished, lather covered and scarcely moving. Returning the glass to his saddlebag, Shano crested the last rise. His eyes were burning with fatigue as he headed the stallion down to the pool, then dismounted and gazed about him. The peak reared like a jagged finger, and he could see the parson almost at the last ledge. It was a long shot for a pistol. "'Welcome, Shano,' came a voice, and the Jerusalem man spun, his pistols levelling at the speaker. Then he saw Beth McAdam. A slender, white-haired man had his arm around her throat, a pistol pointed to her head. 
The speaker, a man from his dreams, stood several paces to the left. "'I have to say, Shano, that I'm grateful to you,' Magellus told him. "'You killed that arrogant swine Rodiel, and that did me a great service. However, the King of Kings has spoken the words of your death.' "'What has she to do with this?' asked Shano. "'She will be released the moment you lay down your weapons. "'And that is the moment I die. "'Exactly. But it will be swift.' "'Magellus drew his pistol. "'I promise you.' "'Shano's guns were still trained on the young man, "'hammers cocked, fingers on the triggers. "'Don't listen to him, Shano. Blow him away!' cried Beth McAdam. "'You will let her go?' Shano asked. "'I am a man of my word,' said Magellus, and Shano nodded. "'Then it is done,' he agreed. At that moment, Beth McAdam lifted her booted foot and slammed it down on Lindian's instep. Ramming her head back into his face, she tore loose from his grip. As Lindian cursed and raised his pistol, Clem Steiner reared up from behind a rock. Lindian saw him and swung, but he was too late. Steiner's pistol boomed, and the slender warrior was hurled to the ground with a bullet in his heart. As Beth made her move, Magellus fired, and the shell swept Shano's hat from his head. The Jerusalem man triggered his pistols. Magellus staggered, but did not go down. Again Shano fired, and Magellus sank to his knees, still struggling to lift his gun. The pistol dropped from his fingers, and he raised his head. "'I like you, Shano,' he said with a weak smile. Then his eyes closed, and he toppled forward. Shano ran to Steiner. The wound in his chest had opened, and his face was ghostly as he sat back on a rock. "'Page your back, Shano,' he whispered. Beth approached him. "'You're a crazy Clem.' But thanks. How the hell did you get here? I wasn't out for long. Bull came by to see me, and I left the kids with him and followed the tracks. Looks like we should be safe now. Not yet, said Shano. The parson had reached the ledge and was now out of range. They watched him lift his hand. The sword of God trembled in the sky. Shano ran to the base of the peak and stripped off his black coat, dropping it to the ground. Then he reached up, took hold of a jutting rock, and hauled himself up. The peak loomed above him. His fingers reached for other holes, and the slow climb began. Beth and Steiner sat down to watch his progress. High above, on the ledge, the parson began to chant broken verses from the Old Testament. A sword, a sword drawn for the slaughter, polished to consume and to flash like lightning. For thus saith the Lord God, when I shall make thee a desolate city, when I shall bring up the deep upon thee, and great waters shall cover thee, I shall make thee a terror, and thou shalt be no more. Though thou be sought for, yet shall thou never be found again, saith the Lord God. His voice echoed on the wind. Amazika stumbled over the crest of the hill, the mare dead on the slope. She ran down to the poolside and saw Shano inching his way up the rock face. No! she shouted. Let him be, Shano! Let him be! But the Jerusalem man did not respond. As Amazika drew her pistol and aimed it at him, Beth ran across the stones and hurled herself at the other woman. The pistol fired, splintering the rock by Shano's left hand. He flinched instinctively and almost fell. Beth tore the gun from Amaziga's hand and threw the woman from her. "'We have to stop him,' said Amaziga. "'We have to!' A rumbling roar came from the sky. The base of the sword was becoming flame and smoke. Shano climbed on. Minutes fled by. On the rock face, Shano was tiring, his arms trembling with the effort of dragging himself upwards. But he was close now. Sweat bathed his face as he forced his weary limbs to respond. He could hear the parson's voice above him. "'I will breathe out my wrath upon you, and breathe out my fiery anger against you. 
wail and say alas for that day, a time of doom for the nations. As the missile trembled, several planes on the edge of the stasis field broke clear, the sound of their engines roaring over the desert beyond the peak. Shano reached the ledge and hauled himself over it. For several seconds, exhausted, he could do nothing. The parson saw him. Welcome, brother! Welcome! Today you will hear a sermon unlike any other, for the sword of God is coming home. No, Shano told him. It is no sword, parson. But the man did not hear him. This is a blessed day. This is my destiny. With a terrifying roar, the missile burst clear of the field and began to rise. No! screamed the parson. No, come back! He held up his hand. The missile slowed its rise and began to turn in the air. The tower rumbled. A great flash of lightning seared the sky to the south, the air parting like a curtain, and a second sun shone in the sky. Shano pushed himself to his knees. From the ledge he could see the immense gateway opened by Pendaric and the massed ranks of his legions beyond it. The light was unbearable. In the sky the missile had almost completed its turn. Shano drew his pistol. The earthquake hit just as he was about to fire on the parson. A huge crack snaked across the desert. The pool disappeared. The tower buckled, great slabs of stone peeling from the walls. Shano dropped his pistol and grasped a jutting rock. The parson, concentrating on the missile, lost his footing and tumbled from the ledge, his body shattering on impact with the rocks below, where once the pool had been. Clem Steiner, Beth, and Amaziga ran from the edge of the new chasm, taking shelter higher on the slopes. Shano pushed himself upright. The missile was coming back towards him. He stared sullenly at the weapon of his own destruction, wishing he could hurl the monster through the gaping gateway. In response to his thoughts, the missile wavered and twisted in the air. Shano did not understand the miracle, for he did not know of the Sipstrassi stone pulsing its power beyond the rock— but his heart leapt with the realization that the sword of God was responding to his wishes. He concentrated with all the strength he could muster. Like a spear, the silver missile sped through the gate of time. Pendaric's legions watched it pass. On it flew, one section breaking away. For some moments Shano experienced a sense of bitter disappointment, for nothing had happened. Then came the light of a thousand suns and a sound like the end of worlds. The gateway disappeared. Chapter 33 New Casizatra opened his eyes to find he was standing within the circle of stones beyond the royal gardens, two hundred paces from the Temple of Ad. Stars shone brightly in the sky, and the city slept. He ran from the circle, down the tree-lined avenue of kings, and on through the gates of pearl and silver. An old beggar awoke as he passed, stretching out his hand. "'Help me, Highness,' he said drowsily, but Nu ran by him. The man sent a whispered curse after him, and settled down to sleep beneath his thin blankets." Nu was breathing heavily by the time he reached the street of merchants. He slowed to a walk, then ran again, coming at last to the bolted gate by his own gardens. Glancing left and right, he grasped the iron grill and began to climb. Once over the top, he dropped to the earth and loped towards the house. A huge hound bore down on him, but when Nu knelt and held out his hand, the hound stopped short, sniffing at him. "'Come on, Nimrod!' It hasn't been that long, said Nu. The black hound's tail began to wag, and Nu rubbed at the beast's long ears. Let's find your mistress. The house doors were also bolted, but Nu pounded on the wood. A light flickered in an upper window, and a servant stepped out to the balcony. Who is it? 
came a voice. Open the door. The master of the house is home, called Nu. Sweet Kronos, exclaimed the servant Purat. Moments later the bolts were drawn back, and Nu stepped into the house. Purat, an elderly retainer, blinked as he saw the strange garb worn by his master, but Nu allowed no time for questions. Rouse the servants, he said, and pack all your belongings, and food for a journey. Where are we going, lord? Purat asked. To safety, God willing. Nu ran up the winding staircase and opened the door to his bedroom, where Pashad was asleep. He sat on the wide, silk-covered bed and stroked her dark hair, and her eyes opened. "'Is this another dream?' she whispered. "'It is no dream, beloved. I am here.' She sat up and threw her arms around her husband's neck. "'I knew you would come. I prayed so hard.' We have no time, Pashad. The world we know is about to end, even as the Lord Kronos told me. We must get away to the docks. Which of my ships is in harbour? Arcano alone stands ready. She will carry a shipment of livestock to the eastern colony. Then Arcano it is. Fetch the children. Pack warm clothes. We will go to the dock and seek out Conalis, the master. He must be prepared to sail at dusk tomorrow. But the manifest has not been cleared, beloved. They will not allow us to sail. They will close the harbour mouth. I do not think so. Not on this coming day of days. Now, dress swiftly and do as I bid you. Pasha had pushed aside the silk sheet and rose from the bed. Much has happened since you left us, she told him, slipping from her nightgown and pulling a warm woolen dress from the chest by the window. Half the merchants and artisans from the East Quarter have vanished. It is said that the king has taken them to another world. There is great excitement in the city. You know my second cousin, Caria? She is married to the court astrologer, Araxis. She says that a huge Sipstrasi stone has been taken to the Star Tower. It is said to catch a great weapon our enemies are sending against us. What? The star tower? Yes. Caria says Araxis is very concerned. The king told him that enemies in another world will be seeking to destroy the empire. And they have set up a stone to prevent it? Listen to me, Pashad. Take the children and find Conalis. Tell him to prepare for a dusk sailing. I will join you at the dock. Where is Arcano birthed? The twelfth jetty. Why are you not coming with us? He strode to her, taking her in a powerful embrace. I cannot. There is something I must do. But trust me, Pashad. I love you. He kissed her swiftly and then ran from the room. Two of the retainers were waiting in the courtyard. Beside them were hastily packed chests while Purat was leading a horse and wagon along the pathway from the gate. The dawn was bright in the sky now. Purat, harness the chariot. I need it now. Uh, yes, Lord, but the white pair have been loaned to Bonantai. There is only the bay mare and a gelding, and they are not a team. Do it. Uh, at once, Lord. Within minutes, no Kazazatra was lashing the team back along the Avenue of Kings towards the distant Star Tower. The gelding was stronger than the mare, and it was hard to control the wooden chariot, but Nu drove recklessly, relying on his strength to keep the beasts under control. The chariot bounced on a jutting stone, lifting Nu from his feet, but he steadied himself and raced on through the doomed city. The Lord had commanded him to find the Sword of God. He had failed. But Shano had promised to find it and do what needed to be done. At last Nu understood what that meant. Shano would send the sword through the gateway, and this was how the world would end. The sword of God was the bright light of Nu's vision, and Araxis was using Sipstrasi power to stop it. The sky was bright now, the morning upon him, as Nu swung the chariot into the courtyard below the star tower. 
Two sentries ran to him, seizing the bridles of the sweating horses. Nu leapt to the ground. Is Araxis here? he asked. The men eyed his strange clothing and exchanged glances. I have to see him on a matter of great urgency, stated Nu. I think you should come with us, sir, said one of the sentries, moving towards him. The captain of the guard will want to question you. No time, said Nu, his huge fist clubbing into the man's jaw. The sentry dropped like a stone. The other man was struggling to draw his sword when Nu leapt at him. Nu's fist rose and fell, and the second sentry fell alongside his companion. The door to the tower stairs was bolted from the inside. When Nu slammed his shoulder against it, the wood buckled but did not give. He stepped back and hammered his foot against the lock. The door exploded inwards. Taking the steps two at a time, Nu climbed to the tower. A second door was not locked, and he stepped inside. A dark, handsome man, wearing a golden circlet on his brow, was leaning over a desk, working on a large chart. He glanced up as Nu entered. "'Who are you?' he demanded. "'Nu Kazizatra. The man's eyes widened. "'You have been named as a traitor and a heretic. What do you want here?' "'I've come to stop you, Araxis, in the name of the Most Holy.' You don't know what you're saying. The world is at risk. The world is dead. You know that I speak the truth. You have seen the future, astrologer. The king's evil has destroyed the balance of harmony in the world. The Lord Cronus has decreed his evil should end. But there are thousands, hundreds of thousands of innocents... We have a thousand years of civilization to protect. You must be wrong. Wrong. I have seen the fall of worlds. I have walked in the ruins of Ad. I have seen the statue of Pendaric toppled by a shark in the depths below the oceans. I am not wrong. I can stop it. I can, no. This sword of God is only a mighty machine. I can hold it with a sipstrasi, send it where it can cause no killing. I cannot allow you to make the attempt, said Nu softly, glancing at the clear blue sky. You cannot stop it, traitor. The power is spread across the gateway like a shield. It also covers the city. Any metallic object in the sky around Ad will be trapped— Nothing can get through. You can kill me, Nu Kazizatra, but that will not change the magic. You cannot approach the stone and live, for there are mighty spells protecting it. Nu swung to look at the giant Sipstrasi stone. Golden wires were welded to its surface, and these led to six crystal spheres supported on a framework of silver. Get out while you can, said Araxis. Since we are linked by marriage, I will give you an hour before I notify the king of your return. Nu ignored him. Striding to the desk, he swept the parchment from it and pushed his hands under the oak top. The heavy desk lifted. No, screamed Araxis, hurling himself at the larger man. Nu released the desk and turned just as the astrologer's body struck him. As both men fell, Nu sent a backhand blow into Raxus's face. Stunned, yet still he clung to Nu. The shipbuilder surged upright, hurling Araxis against the far wall. Then he turned again to the desk, hoisted it above his head, and, with a grunt, threw it into the silver framework. Lightning lanced around the room, shattering a long window and setting fire to the velvet curtains that hung there. The silver framework melted. One of the crystals had been smashed by the desk. Three others had fallen to the floor. Nu seized a stool and hammered them to shards. "'You don't know what you've done,' whispered Araxis, blood seeping from a cut on his temple. A shout went up from the courtyard. Nu cursed and ran to the window. Three more guards had appeared and were kneeling by the bodies of the sentries. Nu raced down the stairs. Two of the guards were entering the doorway as he came into sight, and he dived at them, his weight sending them sprawling to the ground. 
Running into the sunlight, he ducked a sweeping sword cut and backhanded the wielder from his feet. Then, leaping into the chariot, he took up the whip and cracked it over the heads of the two horses. They surged into the traces and hurtled out through the gateway. In the high star tower, Araxes struggled to his feet. Four of the crystals were ruined, and he had no time now to repair the damage. Two still hung in place, enough to send a beam of power over the city of Ad. If the sword was directed towards Ad, the stone could still catch it in the sky and nullify its awesome power. If it missed the city, then it could explode harmlessly in the wide ocean beyond. Araxis moved to the great stone and began to whisper words of power. As the racing chariot sped towards the city, New hoped he'd done enough to wreck Araxis's plans. If he had not, then Shano's world would face the agony of Pendaric's evil. The horses were tired, and it was two hours before New guided the chariot into the docks. The Arcano was berthed at the twelfth jetty, as Pashat had told him. He left the chariot and ran up the gangplank. Canalis saw him and moved from the tiller to usher him below decks. "'This is madness, Highness,' said the burly master. "'The tides are against us. We have no manifest, and the livestock are still being loaded. "'This is a day of madness. Is my wife here?' "'Yes, and your sons and your servants. They are all below decks. "'But there is an inspection planned. What will I tell the port master?' "'Tell him what you please. Do you have a family, Cornalis?' A wife and two daughters. Get them on board, now. Why? I wish to give them a great present. You, also. That should suffice. Now, I am going to sleep for a couple of hours. Wake me at dusk. Now, tell any of the crew who have wives or sweethearts to bring them aboard also. I have presents for all. Whatever you say, Hannes. But it would be best for me to say the Lady Pasha has presents. You are still named as a traitor. Wake me at dusk, and put off the inspection until tomorrow. Yes, Highness. No spread himself out on the narrow bunk, too tired even to seek Pasha. His eyes closed, and sleep overcame him within seconds. He awoke with a start to find Pasha sitting beside him. His eyes were heavy with sleep, and it seemed only moments before that he had lowered himself to the bunk. "'It is dusk, my lord,' said Pasha, and he rose. "'Are the children well?' "'Yes, all are safe. But the ship is crowded now with the wives and children of the crew. "'Get them all below. I will speak to Canales. Send him to the tiller. What is happening, Nu? This is all beyond me. You will not have long to wait, beloved. Believe me. Canales met him at the tiller. I do not understand this, Highness. You said you wanted to sail at dusk, but now we are full of women and children who must be put ashore. No one is going ashore, Nu told him, scanning the sky. Canales muttered a curse. At the far end of the dock, a squad of soldiers was marching towards them. Word must be out that you are here, said the master. Now we are all doomed. No shook his head. Look, there, he shouted, his arm lancing up, finger pointing to the sky, where a long silver arrow was arcing across the heavens. Cut the ropes, bellowed No. Do it now, if you value your life. Canalis lifted an axe from a hook near the stern and hammered it through the docking rope. Running forward, he did the same at the prow. The Arcano drifted away from the jetty, and Nu pushed the tiller hard left. Feeling the ship move, many of the women and children surged up to the deck. On the dock, the soldiers ran to the quayside, but the gap was too great to jump. Across the mouth of the bay, a long trireme waited, its bronze ramming horn glinting in the light of the dying sun. "'It'll sink us!' shouted Canales. "'No, it will not,' Nu told him. 
In the distance, a colossal burst of white light was followed by an explosion that rocked the earth. A terrible tremor ran through the city, and the Arcano trembled. "'Shall I loose the sail?' Canales shouted. "'No, a sail would destroy us. Get everyone below.' The sky darkened. Then the sun swept majestically back into the sky, and a hurricane wind roared across the city. Nu took his sipstrassy stone from the pocket of his jacket and whispered a prayer. The tidal wave, more than a thousand feet high, thundered across the city, and Nu could see giant trees whirling in the torrent. If any were to strike the Arcano, the vessel would be smashed to tinder. Their prow slowly swung until it pointed straight at the gigantic wall of water. Clutching the Sipstrassi, Nu felt the shock of the wave. The ship was lifted as if by a giant hand and carried high into the roaring swell, yet not one drop of water splashed the decks. Up and up soared the vessel until it crested the wave and bobbed on the surface. Far below them, the trireme was lifted like a cork and hammered against the cliffs on the outer curve of the bay. The ship exploded on impact and disappeared beneath the torrent. To the east, the plume of the wave raced on. In the sudden silence, Canalis moved alongside Nu, his face ashen. It's all gone, he whispered. The world is destroyed. No, said Nu, not the world, only Atlantis. Raise the sail. When the waters subside, we must find a new home. The lowing of the livestock brought a wry smile from Nu. At least we'll have cattle and sheep, he said. Pashad came onto the deck, leading her sons Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Nu strode to meet her. What will we do now? she asked. Where shall we go? Wherever it is, we will be together, he promised. Chapter 34 Shanno sank back on his haunches. Suddenly he felt good, better than he had in years. It was a most curious sensation. Despite his lack of rest, he felt such strength in his limbs. A crack opened on the ledge, and he felt the tower move. Swiftly he levered himself over the side and began to climb down. The tower shivered, the top section breaking away and crashing down. Shano hugged himself to the wall as the rocks and stones plunged past him. Then slowly he completed his descent. Beth ran to him. My God, Shano! Look at you! What the hell happened up there? What's wrong? he asked. You look young, she said. Your hair is dark. Your skin... That's incredible. A low groan came from the left, and Shano and Beth walked to where the parson lay, his body broken, blood seeping from his right ear, his left leg bent under him. Shano knelt by the man. The sword, whispered the parson. Shano cradled the man's head. It went where God intended. I'm dying, Shano, and he won't appear to me. I failed him. Rest easy, person. You earned the right to make mistakes. I failed him. We all fail him, said Shano softly, but he doesn't seem to mind much. You did your best and you worked hard. You saved the town. You did a lot of good. He saw that, person. He knows. I wanted him to love me. Wanted to earn. His voice faded. I know. Rest easy, you're going home, parson. You'll see the glory. No. I've been evil, Shano. I've done such bad things. Tears welled in the parson's eyes. I'll be in hell. I don't think so, Shano assured him. If you hadn't come to this peak, then... Maybe the world would have toppled again. 
None of us is perfect person. At least you tried to walk the road. Pray for me, Shano. I'll do that. It wasn't God, was it? No. Rest easy. The parson's eyes closed, and the last breath rattled from his throat. Shanna stood. Did you mean that? Beth asked. You think he won't roast in hell? The Jerusalem man shrugged. I hope not. He was a tortured soul, and I like to think God looks kindly on such men. Amaziga Archer approached. Why did you shoot at me? asked Shanna. To try to change the past, Shano. I read the gold scrolls. Suddenly she laughed. The circle of history, Jerusalem man. Pendarek took over the mind of the parson, or God speaker, as he was named in the scrolls of Araxis. Through him, Pendarek learned that a great weapon would be hurled at Atlantis, that through this weapon the world would topple. Do you know what Pendarek did? He had Sipstrasi transferred to this tower and ordered Araxis to set the power to trap the sword when it came over Ad. Do you understand what I am saying? Twelve thousand years ago, Pendarek set this stasis field in operation in order to catch a missile. And it caught it twelve thousand years later. Can you see? No, said Shannon. It's so disgustingly perfect. If Pendarek had not learned of the missile and had made no effort to catch it, then it would not have been here at all. You can't change the past, Shano. You can't. But why did you try to kill me? Because you just destroyed two worlds. If you had not sent that bomb into the past, our old world could not have been destroyed. You see, Pandaric was also responsible for the second fall. I thought I could change his story, but no. She looked at Shano, and he saw the anguish and hatred in her eyes. You're not the Jerusalem man anymore, Shano. Oh, no. Now you are the Armageddon man, the destroyer of worlds. Shano did not reply, and Amaziga turned from him and strode to the ruins of the tower. The encrusted rocks had been dashed away, the white marble showing through. There was a broken doorway, and Amaziga pushed away inside. A dust-covered skeleton lay close to the Sipstrasi, which had fallen from its bowl. There were rings on the skeletal fingers, and a gold band still circled the brow. Then Shano, Beth, and Steiner entered the chamber. Shano led Steiner to the Sipstrasi and touched the Pistilia's hand to it. The veins of gold were thin now, but still the power surged through him, healing his wounds. Outside they could hear the roaring of engines as the once trapped planes continued to circle, seeking places to land. Amazigo knelt and lifted a scroll of golden foil. The sword, she read, did not pass near Ad. But then a noise came, and a pillar of smoke. A strange phenomenon has just occurred. The sun, which was setting, has just risen again, and I can see dark storm clouds racing towards us. Dark, blacker than any storm of memory. No, not a storm. The traitor was right. It is the sea. Amaziga dropped the foil and stood. The missile was the final touch to a world straining on its axis. She turned to the skeleton. I would guess this was Araxis. Even the Sipstrasi could not save him from the tidal wave he saw. God, Shano, how I hate you. Stop your whinging, snarled Beth McAdam. It wasn't Shanna who destroyed the worlds. It was Pandaric. He opened the gates. He set up whatever it was you call it to trap the sword of God. And it destroyed him. What right have you to condemn a man who only fought to save his friends? Leave her alone, 
said Shano softly. No, answered Beth, her cold blue eyes locked to Amazega. She knows the truth. When a gun kills a man, it is not the weapon that goes on trial, but the man whose finger is on the trigger. She knows that. Here is a bringer of death, Amazega hissed. He destroyed my community. My husband died because of him. My son is dead. Now two worlds have toppled because of him. Tell me, Shano, asked Beth, why you came to the sword? It does not matter, answered the Jerusalem man. Let it rest, Beth. No, she said again. While Magellus and Lindian held me captive, they used their power stones to observe you, and they let me see. It was you, she said, swinging once more to Amaziga, who urged Shano, pleaded with him to come here and stop the parson. It was you who sent him scaling that peak and risking his life. So whose finger was on the trigger, you bitch? It was not my fault, shouted Amaziga. I didn't know. And he did. John Shano knew that if the sword passed through the gate, it would destroy two worlds. You make me sick. Carry your own guilt like the rest of us. Don't seek to palm it off on the man who just saved all our lives. Amaziga backed away from Beth's anger and walked out into the sunlight. Shano followed her. I'm sorry for your loss, he said. Samuel Archer was a fine man. I don't know what else to say to you. Amaziga sighed. The woman is right in what she says, and you are just part of the circle of history. Forgive me, Shano. No Kazizatra said he was sent to find the sword of God. He found it. No, he didn't, said Shano sadly. There was no sword, only a foul instrument of mass death. She placed her hand on his arm. He found the sword, Shano, because he found you. You were the sword of God. I hope no survived, said Shano, changing the subject. I like the man. Amaziga laughed. Oh, he survived, John Shano. Be assured of that. Is there something else in the scrolls, then? No, she shook her head. No is the Arabic form, and Kazizatra the Assyrian name for Noah. You remember what he said about the circle of God? No Kazizatra came to the future and read of Noah's survival in your Bible, Shano. So he went home rescued his family and, I should imagine, with the aid of the Sipstrasi, created a ship that was storm-proof. How's that for a circle of God? Her laughter was almost hysterical. Then the weeping began. Come away, said Beth McAdam, taking Shano by the arm and leading him back towards the horses. Some planes had already begun to land on the hard-baked sand of the desert. "'What are they?' asked Beth. "'Nothing that I would see,' he told her, as Flight 19 touched down four centuries after takeoff. Together, Shano and Beth rode from the desolated pool. "'What will you do now, Shano?' she asked. "'Now that you are young again, I mean?' Will you still seek Jerusalem? I've spent half a lifetime pursuing that dream, Beth. It was a mistake. You don't find God across a distant hill. There are no answers in stone. Turning back in the saddle, he gazed at the broken peak and the forlorn figure of Amaziga Archer. Reaching out, he took Beth's hand, lifting it to his lips. If you'll have me, I'd like to come home. Epilogue Under the leadership of Edric Scazy and the committee, led by Josiah Broom, Pilgrim's Valley prospered.
The church was rebuilt, and, for want of a preacher, a young bearded farmer named John Cade took the service. If any noted the resemblance between Cade and a legendary killer called Shano, none mentioned it. Far to the south, a beautiful black woman walked with a golden, black-maned lion at her side, and climbed the last hill before the ocean. There she stood, staring out to sea, feeling the cool of the ocean breeze, watching the sun's broken reflection on the rippling waves. Beside her, the lion turned his head and focused on a herd of deer grazing on a distant hillside. He did not know why the woman had stopped here, but he was hungry and padded off in search of food. Amaziga Archer watched him go, tears welling to her cheeks. Farewell, Oshiri, she said, but the lion did not hear her. You've been listening to The Last Guardian, written by David Gemmel and read by Christian Rodska. The Last Guardian is one of three books in the John Shano series, so if you enjoyed The Last Guardian, listen out for Bloodstone and Wolf in Shadow. Here's an extract from Bloodstone. Chapter 1 The pain was too great to ignore, and nausea threatened to swamp him as he rode. But the preacher clung to the saddle and steered the stallion up towards the gap, the full moon was high in the clear sky, the distant mountain peaks sharp and glistening white against the skyline. The sleeve of the rider's black coat was still smouldering, and a gust of wind brought a tongue of flame. Fresh pain seared through him, and he beat at the cloth with a smoke-blackened hand. Where were they now, he thought, pale eyes scanning the moonlit mountains and the lower passes. His mouth was dry, and he reined in the stallion. A canteen hung from the pommel, and the preacher hefted it, unscrewing the brass cap. Lifting it to his lips, he found it was filled not with water, but with a fiery spirit. He spat it out and hurled the canteen away. Cowards! They needed the dark inspiration of alcohol to aid them on their road to murder. His anger flared, momentarily masking the pain. Far down the mountain, emerging from the timber line, he saw a group of riders. His eyes narrowed. Five men. In the clear air of the mountains he heard the distant sound of laughter. The rider groaned and swayed in the saddle, the pounding in his temple increasing. He touched the wound on the right side of his head. The blood was congealing now, but there was a groove in the skull where the bullet had struck— and the flesh around it was hot and swollen. He felt consciousness slipping from him, but fought back using the power of his rage. Tugging the reins, he guided the stallion up through the gap, then angled it to the right, down the long wooded slope towards the road. The slope was treacherous, and the stallion slipped twice, dropping to its haunches. But the rider kept the animal's head up, and it righted itself coming at last to level ground and the hard-packed earth of the trade road. The preacher halted his mount, then looped the reins around the pommel and drew his pistols. Both were long-barreled, the cylinders engraved with swirls of silver. He shivered and saw that his hands were trembling. How long had it been since these weapons of death were last in use? Fifteen years? Twenty? I swore never to use them again, never to take another life. And you were a fool. Love your enemy. Do good to him that hates you. And see your loved ones slain. If he strikes you upon the right cheek, offer him the left. And see your loved ones burn. He saw again the roaring flames, heard the screams of the terrified and the dying. Nasha, running from the blazing door as the roof timbers cracked and fell upon her, Dover kneeling beside the body of her husband, Nolis, her fur ablaze, pulling open the burning door, only to be shot to ribbons by the jeering, drunken men outside. The riders came into sight and saw the lone figure waiting for them. It was clear that they recognized him, but there was no fear in them. 
This he found strange, but then he realized they could not see the pistols which were hidden by the high pommel of the saddle, nor could they know the hidden secret of the man who faced them. The riders urged their horses forward, and he waited silently as they approached. All trembling was gone now, and he felt a great calm descend upon him. "'Well, well,' said one of the riders, a huge man wearing a double-shouldered canvas coat. "'The devil looks after his own, eh? "'You made a bad mistake following us, preacher. "'It would have been easier for you to die back there.' "'The man produced a double-edged knife. "'Now I'm going to skin you alive.' "'For a moment he did not reply. "'Then he looked the man in the eyes. "'Were they ashamed when they had committed the abomination?' "'He quoted. "'No, they were not ashamed and could not blush.' The pistol in his right hand came up, the movement smooth, unhurried. For a fraction of a second the huge raider froze, then he scrabbled for his own pistol. It was too late. He did not hear the thunderous roar, for the heavy caliber bullets smashed into his skull ahead of the sound and catapulted him from the saddle. The explosion terrified the horses, and all was suddenly chaos. The preacher's stallion reared, but he readjusted his position and fired twice— the first bullet ripping through the throat of a lean, bearded man, the second punching to the back of a rider who had swung his horse in a vain bid to escape the sudden battle. A fourth man took a bullet in the chest and fell screaming to the ground, where he began to crawl towards the low undergrowth at the side of the road. The last raider, managing to control his panicked mount, drew a long pistol and fired. The bullet came close, tugging at the collar of the preacher's coat. Twisting in the saddle, he fired his left-hand pistol twice, and the assailant's face disappeared as the bullets hammered into his head. Riderless horses galloped away into the night, and he surveyed the bodies. Four men were dead. The fifth, wounded in the chest, was still trying to crawl away and leaving a trail of blood behind him. Nudging the stallion forward, the rider came alongside the crawling man. I will surely consume them, saith the Lord. The crawling man rolled over. Oh, Jesus Christ, don't kill me. I didn't want to do it. I didn't kill any of them, I swear it. By their works shall ye judge them, said the rider. The pistol leveled. The man on the ground threw up his hands, crossing them over his face. The bullet tore through his fingers and into his brain. It is over, said the preacher. Dropping the pistols into the scabbards at his hip, he turned the stallion and headed for home. Weariness and pain overtook him then, and he slumped forward over the horse's neck. The stallion, with no guidance now from the man, halted. The rider had pointed him towards the south, but that was not the home the stallion knew. For a while it stood motionless, then it started to walk, heading east and out into the plains. It plodded on for more than an hour, then caught the scent of wolves. Shapes moved to the right. The stallion whinnied and reared. The weight fell from its back, and then it galloped away. Jeremiah knelt by the sleeping man, examining the wound in the temple. He did not believe the skull to be cracked, but there was no way of being sure— the bleeding had stopped, but massive bruising extended up into the hairline and down across the cheekbone almost all the way to the jaw. Jeremiah gazed down at the man's face. It was lean and angular, the eyes deep-set. The mouth was thin-lipped, yet not, Jeremiah considered, cruel. There was much to learn about a man by studying his face, Jeremiah knew, as if the experiences of life were mirrored there in code. Perhaps, he thought, every act of weakness or spite, bravery or kindness, made a tiny mark, added a line here and there that could be read like a script. Maybe this was God's way of allowing the holy to perceive the wickedness in the handsome. It was a good thought. The sick man's face was strong, but there was little kindness there, Jeremiah decided, though equally there was no evil. Gently he bathed the head wound, then drew back the blanket. 
The burns to the man's arm and shoulder were healing well, though several blisters were still seeping pus. Jeremiah turned his attention to the man's weapons. Revolvers made by the Hellborn, single-action pistols. Hefting the first, he drew back the hammer into the half-cock position, then flipped the release, exposing the cylinder. Two shells had been fired. Jeremiah removed an empty cartridge case and examined it. The weapon was not new. In the years before the Second Satan Wars, the Hellborn had produced double-action versions of the revolver, with slightly shorter barrels and squat, rectangular automatic pistols and rifles that were far more accurate than these pieces. Such weapons had not saved them from annihilation. Jeremiah had seen the destruction of Babylon. The deacon had ordered it raised, stone by stone, until nothing remained save a flat, barren plain. The old man shivered at the memory. The injured man groaned and opened his eyes. Jeremiah felt the coldness of fear as he gazed into them. The eyes were the misty, grey-blue of a winter sky, piercing and sharp, as if they could read his soul. How are you feeling? he asked, as his heart hammered. The man blinked and tried to sit. L lie still, my friend. You've been badly wounded. How did I get here? The voice was low, the words softly spoken. My people found you on the plains. You fell from your horse. But before that, you were in a fire and were shot. The man took a deep breath and closed his eyes. I don't remember, he said at last. <laughs> it happens, said Jeremiah. The trauma from the pain of your wounds. Who are you? I, I don't rem... The man hesitated. Shano. I am John Shano. Oh, an infamous name, my friend. Rest now and I will come back this evening with some food for you. The injured man opened his eyes and reached out, taking Jeremiah's arm. Who are you, friend? I am Jeremiah, a wanderer. The wounded man sank back to the bed. Go and cry in the ears of Jerusalem, Jeremiah, he whispered, then fell once more into a deep sleep. Jeremiah climbed from the back of the wagon, pushing close the wooden door. Isis had prepared a fire, and he could see her gathering herbs by the riverside, her short, blonde hair shining like new gold in the sunlight. He scratched at his white beard and wished he were twenty years younger. The other ten wagons had been drawn up in a half-circle around the river bank, and three other cook-fires were now lit. He saw Meredith kneeling by the first, slicing carrots into the pot that hung above it. Jeremiah strolled across the grass and hunkered down opposite the lean, young academic. "'A life under the sun and stars agrees with you, doctor,' he said amiably. Meredith gave a shy smile and pushed back a lock of sandy hair that had fallen into his eyes. "'Indeed it does, Minia Jeremiah. I feel myself growing stronger with each passing day.' If more people from the city could see this land, there would be less savagery, I am sure. Jeremiah said nothing and transferred his gaze to the fire. In his experience, savagery always dwelt in the shadow of man, and where man walked, evil was never far behind. But Meredith was a gentle soul, and it did a young man no harm to nurse gentle dreams. How is the wounded man? Meredith asked. Recovering, I think, though he claims to remember nothing of the fight that caused his injuries. He says his name is John Shano. Anger shone briefly in Meredith's eyes. A curse on that name, he said. Jeremiah shrugged. It is only a name. Isis knelt by the river bank and stared down at the long, sleek fish just below the glittering surface of the water. It was a beautiful fish, she thought, reaching out with her mind. Instantly her thoughts blurred, then merged with the fish.
She felt the cool of the water along her flanks and was filled with a haunting restlessness, a need to move, to push against the currents, to swim for home. Withdrawing, she lay back and felt the approach of Jeremiah. Smiling, she sat up and turned towards the old man. How is he? she asked as Jeremiah eased himself down beside her. Getting stronger. I'd like you to sit with him. The old man is troubled, but trying to hide it, she thought. Resisting the urge to flow into his mind, she waited for him to speak again. He is a fighter, perhaps even a brigand. I just don't know. It was our duty to help him. But the question is, will he prove a danger to us as he grows stronger? Is he a killer? Is he wanted by the Crusaders? Could we find ourselves in trouble for harbouring him? Will you help me? Oh, Jeremiah, said Isis softly, of course I will help you. <laughs> Did you doubt it? He reddened. I, I know you don't like to use your talent on people. I'm sorry I had to ask. You're a sweet man, she said, rising. Dizziness swept over her, and she stumbled. Jeremiah caught her, and she felt swamped by his concern. Slowly, strength returned to her, but the pain had now started in her chest and stomach. Jeremiah lifted her into his arms and walked back towards the wagons, where Dr. Meredith ran to them. Jeremiah sat her down in the wide rocking chair by the fire, while Meredith took her pulse. No, I'm all right now, she said. Truly. Meredith's slender hand rested on her brow, and it took all her concentration to blot out the intensity of his feelings for her. I'm all right. And the pain? he asked. Fading, she lied. I just got up too quickly. It is nothing. Get some salt, Meredith told Jeremiah. When he returned, Meredith poured it into her outstretched palm. Eat it, he commanded. It makes me feel sick, she protested, but he remained silent, and she licked the salt from her hand. Jeremiah passed her a mug of water, and she rinsed her mouth. You should rest now, said Meredith. I will soon, she promised. Slowly she stood. Her legs took her weight, and she thanked both men. Anxious to be away from their caring glances, she moved to Jeremiah's wagon and climbed inside, where the wounded man was still sleeping. Isis pulled up a chair and sat down. Her illness was worsening, and she sensed the imminence of death. Pushing such thoughts from her mind, she reached out, her small hand resting on the fingers of the sleeping man. Closing her eyes, she allowed herself to fall into his memories, floating down and down through the layers of manhood and adolescence, absorbing nothing until she reached childhood. Two boys, brothers, one shy and sensitive, the other boisterous and rough. Caring parents, farmers. Then the brigands came. Bloodshed and murder, the boys escaping. Torment and tragedy affecting them both in different ways, the one becoming a brigand, the other— Isis jerked back to reality, all thoughts of her illness forgotten now as she stared down at the sleeping man. I'm staring into the face of a legend, she thought. Once more she merged with the man. The Jerusalem man, haunted by the past— tormented by thoughts of the future, riding through the wild lands, seeking a city? Yes, but much more. Seeking an answer, seeking a reason for being. And during his search, stopping to fight brigands, tame towns, kill the ungodly, riding endlessly through the lands, welcome only when his guns were needed, urged to move on when the killing was done. Isis pulled back once more, dismayed and depressed, not just by the memories of constant death and battle, but by the anguish of the man himself. The shy, sensitive child had become the man of violence, feared and shunned, each killing adding yet another layer of ice upon his soul. Again she merged. 
She, he, was being attacked. Men running from the shadows. Gunfire. A sound behind her. Him. Cocking the pistol, Isis, Shano, spun and fired in one motion. A child flung back, his chest torn open. Oh, God, oh, God, oh, God! Isis clawed her way free of the memory, but did not fully withdraw. Instead, she floated upwards, allowing time to pass, halting only when the Jerusalem man rode up to the farm of Donna Tabard. This was different. Here was love. The wagons were moving, and Isis Shano rode out from them, scouting the land, heart full of joy and the promise of a better tomorrow. No more savagery and death, dreams of farming and quiet companionship. Then came the hell-born. Isis withdrew and stood. You poor dear man, she whispered, brushing her hand over the sleeping man's brow. I'll come back tomorrow. Outside the wagon, Dr. Meredith approached her. "'What did you find out?' he asked. "'He is no danger to us,' she answered. The young man was tall and slender, a shock of unruly black hair cut short above the ears, but growing long over the nape of his neck. He was riding an old, sway-backed mare up and over the gap, and stared with the pleasure of youth at the distant horizons, where the mountains reared up to challenge the sky. Nesta Garrity was seventeen, and this was an adventure. The Lord alone knew how rare adventures were in Pilgrim's Valley. His hand curled round the pistol butt at his hip, and he allowed the fantasies to sweep through his mind. He was no longer a clerk at the timber company. No, he was a crusader, hunting the legendary Leighton Duke and his band of brigands. It didn't matter the Duke was feared as the deadliest pistolier this side of the plaguelands, for the hunter was Nestor Garrity, lethal and fast, the bane of war-makers everywhere, adored by women, respected and admired by men. Adored by women... Nestor paused in his fantasy, wondering what it would be like to be adored by women. He'd walked out once with Ezra Feard's daughter, Mary, taken her to the summer dance. She led him outside into the moonlight and flirted with him. Should have kissed her, he thought. Should have done some damn thing. He blushed at the memory. The dance had turned into a nightmare when she walked off with Samuel Clars. They'd kissed. Nesta saw them down by the creek. Now she was married to him and had just delivered her first child. The old mare almost stumbled on the scree slope. Jerked from his thoughts, Nesta steered her down the incline. The fantasies loomed back into his mind. He was no longer Nesta Garrity, the fearless crusader, but John Shano, the famed Jerusalem man, seeking the fabled city and with no time for women. Much as they adored him, Nestor narrowed his eyes and lifted his hat from where it hung at his back. Settling it into place, he turned up the collar of his coat and sat straighter in the saddle. John Shano would never slouch. He pictured two brigands riding from behind the boulders. In his mind's eye, he could see the fear on their faces. They went for their guns. Nestor's hands snapped down. The pistol sight caught on the tip of his holster, twisting the weapon from his hands. It fell to the scree. Carefully, Nestor dismounted and retrieved the weapon. The mare, pleased to be relieved of the boy's weight, walked on. "'Hey, wait!' called Nestor, scrambling towards her. But she ambled on, and the dejected youngster followed her all the way to the bottom, where she stopped to crop at the dry grass. Then Nestor remounted. One day I'll be a crusader, he thought. I'll serve the deacon and the Lord. He rode on. Where was the preacher? It shouldn't take this long to find him. The tracks were easy to follow to the gap. But where was he going? Why did he ride out in the first place? Nestor liked the preacher. He was a quiet man, and throughout Nestor's youth he had treated him with kindness and understanding especially when Nestor's parents had been killed that summer ten years ago, drowned in a flash flood. Nestor shivered at the memory. Seven years old and an orphan. 
Frey McAdam had come to him then, the preacher with her. He'd sat at the bedside and taken Nestor's hand. Why did they die? asked the bewildered child. Why did they leave me? I guess it was their time, only they didn't know it. I want to be dead too, wailed the seven-year-old. The preacher had sat with him then, quietly talking about the boy's parents, of their goodness and their lives. Just for a while the anguish and the numbing sense of loneliness had left Nestor, and he had fallen asleep. Last night the preacher had escaped out of the church, despite the flames and the bullets, and he had run away to hide. Nestor would find him, tell him that everything was all right now and it was safe to come home. Then he saw the bodies, the flies buzzing around the terrible wounds. Nestor forced himself to dismount and approach them. Sweat broke out on his face and the desert breeze felt cold upon his skin. He couldn't look directly at them, so he studied the ground for tracks. One horse had headed back towards Pilgrim's Valley, then turned and walked out into the wild lands. Nestor risked a swift, stomach-churning glance at the dead men. He knew none of them. More importantly, none of them was the preacher. Remounting, he set off after the lone horseman. People were moving on the main street of Pilgrim's Valley as Nestor Garrity rode in, leading the Black Stallion. It was almost noon, and the children were leaving the two school buildings and heading out into the fields to eat the lunches their mothers had packed for them. The stores and the town's three restaurants were open, and the sun was shining down from a clear sky. But a half mile to the north, smoke still spiralled lazily into the blue. Nestor could see Beth McAdam standing amid the blackened timbers as the undertakers moved around the debris, gathering the charred bodies of the wolvers. Nestor didn't relish facing Beth with the news. She'd been the headmistress of the lower school when Nestor was a boy, and no one ever enjoyed the thought of being sent to her study. He grinned, remembering the day he had fought with Charlie Wills. They'd been dragged apart and then taken to Mrs. McAdam. She'd stood in front of her desk, tapping her fingers with a three-foot bamboo cane. "'How many should you receive, Nestor?' she'd asked him. "'I didn't start the fight,' the boy replied. "'That is no answer to my question.' Nestor thought about it for a moment. Four, he said. "'Why four? "'Fighting in the yard is four strokes,' he told her. "'That's the rule.' But did you not also take a swing at Mr. Carstairs when he dragged you off the Atlas, Charlie? That were a mistake, said Nestor. Such mistakes are costly, boy. It will be six for you and four for Charlie. Does that sound fair? Nothing is fair when you're thirteen, said Nestor. But he had accepted the six strokes, three on each hand, and had made no sound. He rode slowly towards the charred remains of the little church, the stallion meekly following his bay mare. Beth McAdam was standing with her hands on her ample hips, staring out towards the wall. Her blonde hair was braided at the back, but a part of the braid had come loose and was fluttering in the wind at her cheek. She turned at the sound of the approaching horse and gazed up at Nestor, her face expressionless. He dismounted and removed his hat. I found the raiders, he said. They was all dead. I expected that, she said. Where is the preacher? No sign of him. His horse headed east and I caught up with it. There was blood on the saddle. I backtracked and found signs of wolves and bears, but I couldn't find him. He is not dead, Nestor, she said. I would know. I would feel it. Here she told him, hitting her chest with a clenched fist. How did he manage to kill five men? They were all armed. All killers. I mean, I never saw the preacher ever carry a gun. Five men, you say, she replied, ignoring the question. There were more than twenty surrounding the church, according to those who saw the massacre. But then I expect there were some of our own loving community. Nestor had no wish to become involved in the dispute. 
Wolvers in a church was hardly decent, anyhow, and it was no surprise to the youngster that tempers had fled. Even so, if the Crusaders hadn't been called out to a brigand raid on Shem Jackson's farm, there would have been no violence. Anything more you want me to do, Mrs. McAdam? She shook her head. That was plain murder, she said. Nothing short. You can't murder wolvers, said Nestor without thinking. I mean, they ain't human, are they? They're animals. Anger shone in Beth's eyes, but she merely sniffed and turned aside. Thank you, Nestor, for your help. But I expect you have chores to do, and I'll not keep you from them. Relieved, he turned away and remounted. What do you want me to do with this stallion? he called. Give it to the Crusaders. It won't ours, and I don't want it. Nestor rode away to the stone-built barracks at the south of town, dismounting and hitching both horses to the rail outside. The door was open, and Captain Leon Evans was sitting at a rough-built desk. "'Good morning, sir,' said Nestor. Evans looked up and grinned. He was a tall, broad-shouldered man with an easy smile. "'Still looking to sign up, boy?' "'Yes, sir. Been reading your Bible?' "'I have, sir, every day. I'll put you in for the test on the first of next month. If you pass, I'll make you a cadet.' I'll pass, sir, I promise. You're a good lad, Nestor. I see you found the stallion. Any sign of the preacher? No, sir, but he killed five of the raiders. The smile faded from Captain Evans's face. Did he, by God? He shook his head. As they say, you can't judge a man by the coat he wears. Did you recognize any of the dead men? Not a one, sir. But three of them had their faces shot away. Looks like he just rode down the hill and blasted them to hell and gone. Five men! Six, said the captain. I was checking the church this morning. There was a corpse there. It looks like when the fire was at its worst, the preacher managed to smash his way out at the rear. There was a man waiting. The preacher must have surprised him. There was a fight, and the preacher managed to get the man's gun. Then he killed him and took his horse. Jack Shale says he saw the preacher riding from town, said his coat and hair were ablaze. Nestor shivered. Who'd have thought it, he said. All his sermons were about God's love and forgiveness. Then he guns down six raiders. Who'd have thought it? I would, boy, came a voice from the doorway, and Nestor turned to see the old prophet making his slow way inside. Leaning on two sticks, his long white beard hanging to his chest, Daniel Cade inched his way to a seat by the wall. He was breathing heavily as he sank to the chair. Captain Evan stood and filled a mug with water, passing it to the prophet. Cade thanked the man. Nestor faded back to the far wall, but his eyes remained fixed to the ancient legend sipping the water. Daniel Cade the former brigand-turned-prophet, who had fought off the Hellborn in the Great War. Everyone knew that God spoke to the old man, and Nestor's parents had been two of the many people saved when Cade's brigands took on the might of the Hellborn army. "'Who burned the church?' asked Cade, his voice still strong and firm, oddly in contrast to the arthritic and frail body. There were raiders from outside Pilgrim's Valley, the captain told him. Not all of them, said Cade. There were townsfolk among the crowd. Sam Jackson was seen. Now, that disturbs me, for isn't that why the Crusaders were not here to protect the church? Weren't you called to Jackson's farm? I we were, said the captain. Brigand stole some of his stock and he rode in to alert us and then stayed on to watch the murders. Curious. I do not condone the burning of the church, sir, said the captain, but it must be remembered that the preacher was told, repeatedly, that wolvers were not welcome in Pilgrim's Valley. They were not creatures of God, not made in his image, nor true creations. They are things of the devil. 
They have no place in a church, nor in any habitat of decent folk. The preacher ignored all the warnings. It was inevitable that some tragedy would befall. I can only hope that the preacher is still alive. It would be sad if a good man, though misguided, were to die. Oh, I reckon he's alive, said Kate. So you'll be taking no action against the townspeople who helped the raiders? I don't believe anyone helped them. They merely observed them. Cade nodded. Does it not strike you as strange that men from outside Pilgrim's Valley should choose to ride in to Lance Arboyle? The work of God is often mysterious, said Evans, as you yourself well know, sir. But tell me, why were you not surprised that the preacher should tackle and destroy six armed men? He shares your name and it is said he is your nephew, or was once one of your men in the Hellborn War. If the latter is true, he must have been very young indeed. Cade did not smile, but Nestor saw the humour in his eyes. He is older than he looks, Captain, and no, he was never one of my men, nor is he my nephew, despite his name. With a grunt, the prophet pushed himself to his feet. Captain Evans took his arm, and Nestor ran forward to gather his sticks. I'm all right. Don't fuss about me. Slowly and with great dignity, the old man left the room and climbed to the driving seat of a small wagon. Evans and Nestor watched as Cade flicked the reins. A great man, said Evans. A legend. He knew the Jerusalem man. Rode with him, some say. I heard he was the Jerusalem man, said Nestor. Evans shook his head. I heard that too, but it is not true. My father knew a man who fought alongside Cade. He was a brigand, a killer. But God shone the great light upon him. The deacon stood on the wide balcony, his silver-white beard rippling in the morning breeze. From this high vantage point he gazed affectionately out over the high walls and down on the busy streets of Unity. Overhead a biplane lumbered across the blue sky, heading east towards the mining settlements, carrying letters and possibly the new barter notes that were slowly replacing the large silver coins used to pay the miners. The city was prospering. Crime was low, and women could walk without risk, even at night, along the well-lit thoroughfares. "'I've done the best I could,' whispered the old man. "'What's that, Deacon?' asked a slender, round-shouldered man with wispy white hair. "'Talking to myself, Geoffrey. Not a good sign.' Turning from the balcony, he re-entered the study. "'Where were we?' The thin man lifted a sheet of paper and peered at it. Uh, there is a petition here asking for mercy for Cameron Sykes. You may recall he's the man who found his wife in bed with a neighbour. He shot them both to death. He's due to hang tomorrow. The old man shook his head. I feel for him, Geoffrey, but you cannot make exceptions. Those who murder must die. What else? Uh, the Apostle Saul would like to see you before setting off for Pilgrim's Valley. Am I free this afternoon? Geoffrey consulted a black leather-bound diary. Four-thirty to five is clear. Shall I arrange it? Yes. I still don't know why he asked for that assignment. Perhaps he's tired of the city. Or perhaps the city is tired of him. <laughs> what else? For half an hour the two men worked through the details of the day, until finally the deacon called a halt and strolled through to the vast library beyond the study. There were armed guards on the doors, and the deacon remembered with sadness the young man who had hidden here two years before. The shot had sounded like thunder within the domed building, striking the deacon just above the right hip and spinning him to the floor. The assailant had screamed and charged across the huge room, firing as he ran. Bullets ricocheted from the stone floor. 
The deacon had rolled over and drawn the small two-shot pistol from his pocket. As the young man came closer, the old man had fired, the bullet striking the assassin just above the bridge of the nose. The youngster stood for a moment, his own pistol dropping to the floor. Then he had fallen to his knees and toppled onto his face. The deacon sighed at the memory. The boy's father had been hanged the day before after shooting a man following an argument over a card game. Now the library and the municipal buildings were patrolled by armed guards. The deacon sat at a long oak table and stared at the banks of shelves while he waited for the woman. Sixty-eight thousand books, or fragments of books, cross-indexed. The last remnants of the history of mankind, contained in novels, textbooks, philosophical tomes, instruction manuals, diaries, and volumes of poetry. And what have we come to, he thought. A ruined world, bastardized by science and haunted by magic. His thoughts were dark and somber, his mind weary. No one is right all the time, he told himself. You can only follow your heart. A guard ushered the woman in. Despite her great age, she still walked with a straight back, her face showing more than a trace of the beauty she had possessed as a younger woman. Welcome, Frey Masters, said the deacon, rising. God's blessing to you and your family. Her hair was silver, the lights from the ornate arched and stained-glass windows created soft highlights of gold and red. Her eyes were blue and startlingly clear. She smiled thinly and accepted his hand. Then she sat opposite him. "'God's greeting to you also, deacon,' she said. "'And I trust he will allow you to learn compassion before much longer?' "'Let us hope so,' said the deacon. "'Now what is the news?' The dreams remain the same, only they are more powerful, she said. Betsy saw a man with crimson skin and black veins. His eyes were red. Thousands of corpses lay around him, and he was bathing in the blood of children. Samantha also dreamed of a demon from another world. She was hysterical upon wakening, and claimed that the devil was about to be loosed upon us. What does it mean, Deacon? Are the visions symbolic? No, he said sadly. The beast exists. The woman sighed. I, too, have been dreaming more of late. I saw a great wolf walking upright. Its hands held hollow talons, and I watched as it sank them into a man, saw the blood drawn out of him. The beast and the wolf are linked, aren't they? He nodded, but did not answer. And you know far more than you are telling me. Has anyone else dreamed of wolves? He asked, ignoring the comment. Alice has seen visions of them, Deacon, said Frey Masters. She says she saw a crimson light bathing a camp of wolves. The little creatures began to writhe and scream. Then they changed, becoming beasts like those in my dream. I need to know when, said the deacon, and where. From his pocket he took a small golden stone, which he twirled against his fingertips. You should use the power on yourself, said the woman sternly. You know that your heart is failing. I've lived too long anyway. No, I'll save its power for the beast. This is the last of them, you know. My little hoard. Soon the world will have to forget magic and concentrate once more on science and discovery. His expression changed. If it survives. It'll survive, Deacon, she said. God must be stronger than any demon. If he wants it to survive. We humans have hardly made the earth a garden now, have we? She shook her head and gave a weary smile. Yet there are still good people, even though we know that the path of evil offers many rewards. Don't give in to despair, Deacon. If the beast comes, there will be those who will battle against it. 
another Jerusalem man, perhaps, or a Daniel Cade. <laughs> Come the moment. Come the man, said the deacon with a dry chuckle. Frey Masters rose. I'll go back to my dreamers. What would you have me tell them? Get them to memorize landscapes, seasons. When it comes, I need to be there to fight it. And I will need help. Standing, he held out his hand, and she shook it briefly. You have said nothing of your own dreams, Frey. My powers have faded over the years. But yes, I have seen the beast. I fear you will not be strong enough to withstand it. He shrugged. I have fought many battles in my life. I am still here. But you are old now. We are old. Strength fails, Deacon. All things pass away, even legends. He sighed. You have done a wonderful job here, he said. All these fragments of a lost civilization. I would like to think that after I am dead, men and women will come here and learn from the best of what the old ones left us. Don't change the subject, she admonished him. You want me to spare the man who killed his wife and her lover? Of course. And you are still changing the subject? Why should I spare him? Because I ask it, Deacon, she said simply. I see. No moral arguments, no scriptural examples, no appeal to my better nature. She shook her head, and he smiled. Very well. He will live. You're a strange man, Deacon, and you're still avoiding the point. Once you could have stood against the beast, not any longer. He grinned and winked at her. I may just surprise you yet, he said. I'll grant you that. You are a surprising man. Shano dreamed of the sea, the groaning of the ship's timbers almost human, the waves like moving mountains beating against the hull. He awoke and saw the lantern above his bed gently swaying on its hook. For a moment the dream and the reality seemed to blend. Then he realized he was in the cabin of a prairie wagon, and he remembered the man Jeremiah, ancient and white-bearded, but with a single long tooth in his upper mouth. Shano took a deep, slow breath, and the pounding pain in his temples eased slightly. With a groan, he sat up. His left forearm and his shoulder were bandaged, and he could feel the tightness of the burnt skin beneath. A fire? He searched his memory, but could find nothing. It doesn't matter, he told himself. The memory will come back. What is important is that I know who I am. John Shano, the Jerusalem man. And yet, even as the thought struck him, he felt uneasy, as if the name was... what? Wrong? No. His guns were hanging from the headboard of the bed. Reaching out, he drew a pistol. It felt both familiar and yet strange in his hand. Flicking the release, he broke open the pistol. Two shells had been fired. Instantly, momentarily, he saw a man fall back from his horse, his throat erupting in a crimson spray. Then the memory vanished. A fight with brigands. Yes, that must have been it, he thought. There was a small hand mirror on a shelf to his right. He took it down and examined the wound in his temple. The bruising was yellowing now, fading fast, and the groove in his skull was covered by a thick scab. His hair had been trimmed close to his head, but he could still see where the fire had scorched the scalp. Fire! Another flash of memory. Planks ablaze, and Shano hurling his body at the timbers time and again until they gave. A man beyond with pistol raised, the shot hitting his head like a hammer. Then that vision also faded. He had been in a church. Why? Listening to a sermon, perhaps? Easing himself from the bed, he saw that his clothes were folded neatly on a chair by a small window, the burned coat having been cleaned and patched with black cloth. 
As he dressed, he looked around the cabin of the wagon. The bed was narrow, but well made of polished pine, and there were two pine chairs and a small table by the window. The walls were painted green. There were elaborate carvings around the window in the shape of vine leaves, and a strange motif had been carved above the door, two overlapping triangles making a star. A bookshelf sat upon two brackets above the bed. Buckling his gun scabbards to his hips, Shano scanned the books. There was a Bible, of course, and several fictions, but at the end was a tall, thin volume with dry, yellowed pages. Shano pulled it clear and carried it to the window. The sun was setting, and he could just make out the title in faded gold leaf. The Chronicle of Western Costume by John Peacock With great care he turned the pages. Greek, Roman, Byzantine, Tudor, Stuart, Cromwellian, every page showed men and women dressed in different clothing, and each page carried dates. It was fascinating. Until the coming of the plains, many men had believed that only three hundred years had passed since the death of Christ, but the men and women travelling in those great ships of the sky had changed all that, consigning the previous theories to the dust of history. Shano paused. How do I know that? He replaced the book, then moved to the rear of the cabin, opening the door and climbing unsteadily down the three steps to the ground. A young woman with short blonde hair was still walking towards him, carrying a dish of stew. You should still be in bed, she admonished him. In truth, he felt weak and breathless and sat back on the wagon steps, accepting the stew. Thank you, lady. She was extraordinarily pretty, her eyes blue-green, her skin pale tan. Is your memory returning, Mr. Shannon? No, he said, then began to eat. It will in time, she assured him. The outside of the wagon was painted in shades of green and red, and from where he sat, Shannon could see ten other wagons similarly decorated. Where are you all going? he asked. "'Where we like,' said the girl. "'My name is Isis.' She held out her hand, and Shano took it. Her handshake was firm and strong. "'You're a good cook, Isis. The stew is very fine.' Ignoring the compliment, she sat down beside him. "'Dr. Meredith thinks you may have a cracked skull. Do you remember nothing at all?' "'Nothing I wish to talk about.' he said. Tell me about you. There is little to tell, she told him. We are what you see, wanderers. We follow the sun and the wind. In summer we dance, in winter we freeze. <laughs> it's a good way to be. It has a certain charm, said Shanna. Yet is there no destination? She looked at him in silence for a moment, her large blue eyes holding his gaze. Life is a journey with only one destination, Mr. Shano, or do you see it otherwise? It doesn't pay to argue with Isis, said Jeremiah, moving into sight. Shano looked up into the old man's grizzled face. I think that is true, he said, rising from the step. He felt unsteady and weak, and reached out to grasp the edge of the wagon. Taking a deep breath, Shanna moved into the open. Jeremiah stepped alongside, taking his arm. You are a tough man, Mr. Shanno, but your wounds were severe. Wounds heal, Jeremiah. Shanno gazed at the mountains. The nearest were speckled with stands of timber, but further away, stretching into an infinite distance, were other peaks, blue and indistinct. It is a beautiful land. The sun was slowly sinking behind the western peaks, bathing them in golden light. Off to the right, Shano focused on a rearing butte, the sandstone seeming to glow from within. It is called Temple Mount, said Jeremiah. Some say it is a holy place where the old gods live. For myself, I believe it to be a resting place for eagles, nothing more. I've not heard the name, 
Shannon told him. The loss of memory must cause you some anguish, said Jeremiah. Not tonight, Shannon answered. I feel at peace. The memories you speak of hold only death and pain. They will come back all too soon, I know this. But for now I can look at the sunset with great joy. The two men walked towards the river bank. Thank you for saving my life, Jeremiah. You're a good man. How long have you uh, lived like this? About uh, twelve years. I was a tailor, but I longed for the freedom of the big sky. And then came the Unifier Wars, and the city life became even more grotesque. So I made a wagon and journeyed out into the wilderness. There were ducks and geese on the river, and Shannon saw the tracks of a fox. How long have you nursed me? Twelve days. For a while the others thought you were going to die. I told them you wouldn't. You have too many scars. You've been shot three times in your life, once over the hip, once in the upper chest, and once in the back. <laughs> there are also two knife wounds, one in the leg and a second in the shoulder. As I said, you are a tough man. You won't die easy. Shanna smiled. That is a comforting thought. <laughs> and I remember the hip wound. He'd been riding close to the lands of the wall and had seen a group of raiders dragging two women into the open. He had ridden in and killed the raiders, but one of them had managed a shot that clipped Shanna's hip bone and ripped through his lower back. He would have died but for the help of the man-beast Shiran, who'd found him in the blizzard. "'You are miles away, Mr. Shanna. What are you thinking?' I was thinking of a lion, Jeremiah. They strolled back up the river bank and towards the campfires in the circle of wagons. Shanna was weary now and asked Jeremiah to loan him some blankets so that he could sleep under the stars. I'll not hear of it, man. You'll stay in that bed for another day or two. Then we'll see. Too tired to argue, Shanna pulled himself up into the wagon. Jeremiah followed him. Fully clothed, Shano stretched out on the narrow bed. The old man gathered some books and made to leave, but Shano called out to him. Why did you say I had an infamous name? Jeremiah turned. The same name as the Jerusalem man. He rode these parts some twenty years ago. <laughs> Surely you've heard of him. Shano closed his eyes. Twenty years. He heard the cabin door click shut, and lay for a while staring through the tiny window at the distant stars. "'How are you feeling? And do not lie to me,' said Dr. Meredith. Isis smiled but said nothing. If only, she thought, Meredith could be as assertive in his life as he was with his patience. Reaching up, she stroked his face. The young man blushed. I am still waiting for an answer, he said, his voice softening. It is a beautiful night, observed Isis, and I feel at peace. That is no answer, he scolded. It will have to suffice, she said. I do not want to concentrate on my debility. We both know where my journey will end, and there's nothing we can do to prevent it. Meredith sighed, his head dropping forward, a sandy lock of hair falling across his brow. Isis pushed it back. You are a gentleman, she told him. A powerless man, he said sadly. I know the name of your condition, as I know the names of the drugs that could overcome it. Hydrocortisone and fludrocortisone. I even know the amounts to be taken. What I do not know is how these steroids were constructed, or from what. Oh, it doesn't matter, she assured him. The sky is beautiful, and I'm alive. Let's talk about something else. I want to ask you about our guest. Meredith's face darkened. What about him? 
He is no farmer, that is for sure. I know that, she said. But why has his memory failed? Meredith shrugged. A blow to his head is the most likely cause. That there are many reasons for amnesia, I says. To tell you more, I would need to know the exact cause of the injury and the events leading up to it. She nodded and considered telling him all she had learned. First, she said, tell me about the Jerusalem man. He laughed, the sound harsh, his face hardening. I thank God that I never met him. He was a butchering savage who achieved some measure of fame vastly greater than he deserved. And this only because we are ruled by another merciless savage who reveres violence. John Chano was a killer. Putting aside the ludicrous quasi-religious texts that are now being published, he was a wandering man who was drawn to violence as a fly is drawn to ox droppings. He built nothing, wrote nothing, sired nothing. He was like a wind blowing across a desert. He fought the hellborn, said Isis, and destroyed the power of the guardians. Exactly, said Meredith sharply. He fought and destroyed. And now he is seen as some kind of saviour, a dark angel sent by God. I wonder sometimes if we will ever be free of men like Shano. You perceive him as evil, then? Meredith stood and added several sticks to the dying fire, then returned to his seat opposite Isis. That is a difficult question to answer. From all I know of the man, he was not a murderer. He never killed for gain. He fought and slew men he believed to be ungodly or wicked. But the point I would make, Isis, is that he decided who was wicked, and he dispensed what he regarded as justice. In any civilized society, such behavior should be deemed abhorrent. It sets a precedent, you see, for other men to follow his line of argument and kill any who disagree. Once we revere a man like Shano, we merely open the door to any other killer who wishes to follow his example. Men like the deacon, for instance. When the Hellborn rose against us, he destroyed not only their army, but their cities. He visited upon them a terrible destruction. And why? Because he decided they were an evil people. Thousands of ordinary Hellborn farmers and artisans were put to death. It was genocide, an entire race destroyed. That is the legacy of men like John Shano. So, tell me, what has this to do with our guest, as you call him? I don't know, she lied. He claims to be Shano, so I wondered if it would have a bearing on his... What did you call it? Amnesia, yes, his amnesia. You asked about the event that led to his being wounded. Isis hesitated, preparing her story. He watched his friends being murdered, horribly murdered. Some shot down, others burned alive. His home was set ablaze. He escaped and took up weapons that he had put aside many years before. He was once a warrior, but had decided this was wrong. But in his pain, he tracked the killers and fought them, killing them all. Does that help? Meredith sat back and let out a long breath. Poor man, he said. I fear I have misjudged him. I saw the guns and assumed him to be a brigand, or a hired man. Yes, indeed it helps, Isis. The mind can be very delicate. I trust your talent, and taking everything you have told me as true, it means that our guest went to war against not only a vile enemy, but his own convictions. His mind has reeled from the enormity of anguish and loss, and closed itself against the memories. It is called protective amnesia. Would it be wise for me to explain it to him? she asked. Under no circumstances, he told her. That is what is meant by protective. 
To tell him now could cause a complete disintegration. Let it come back slowly, in its own time. What is fascinating, however, is his choice of new identity. Why John Shannon? What was his occupation? He was a preacher, she said. That probably explains it, said Meredith, a man of peace forced to become something he loathed. What better identity to choose than a man who purported to be religious, but was actually a battle-hardened killer? Look after him, Isis. He will need that special care only you can supply. Everyone is wrong and you're right. Is that what you're saying, mother? The young man's face was flushed with anger as he rose from the dinner table and strode to the window, pushing it open and staring out over the tilled fields. Beth McAdam took a deep breath, struggling for calm. I am right, Samuel, and I don't care what everyone says. What is being done is no less than evil. Samuel McAdam rounded on her then. Evil, is it? Evil to do the work of God? Huh. You have a strange idea of what constitutes evil. How can you argue against the word of the Lord? Now it was Beth who became angry, her pale blue eyes narrowing. You call murder the work of God? The wolvers have never harmed anyone. And they didn't ask to be the way they are. God alone knows what caused them to be, but they have souls, Samuel. They are gentle and they are kind. They are an abomination, shouted Samuel. And as the book says, Neither shalt thou bring an abomination into thine house, lest thou be a cursed thing like it. There is only one abomination in this house, Samuel, and I bore it. Get out! Go back to your murdering friends, and tell them from me, if they ride onto my lands for one of their Wilver hunts, I'll meet them with death and fire. The young man's jaw dropped. Have you taken leave of your senses? There are neighbours you're talking of killing. Beth walked to the far wall and lifted down the long-barrelled Hellborn rifle. Then she looked at her son, seeing not the tall, wide-shouldered man he had become, but the small boy who once feared the dark and wept when thunder sounded. She sighed. He was a handsome man now, his fair hair close-cropped, his chin strong. But like the child he once had been, he was still easily led, a natural follower, you tell him, Samuel, exactly what I said, and if there are any who doubt my word, you can put them right. The first man to hunt down my friends dies. You've been seduced by the devil, he said, then swung away and strode through the door. As Beth heard his horse galloping away into the night, a small form moved from the kitchen and stood behind her. Beth turned and forced a smile, Reaching out, she stroked the soft fur of the creature's shoulder. Oh, I'm sorry you heard that, Pakia, Beth sighed. He's always been malleable, like clay in the hands of the potter. I blame myself for that. I was too hard on him. Never let him win. Now he's like a reed that bends with every breeze. The little wolver tilted her head to one side. Her face was almost human, yet fur-covered and elongated, her eyes wide and oval, the colour of mixed gold, tawny with red flecks. "'When will the preacher come back?' she asked, her long tongue slurring the words. "'I don't know, Pakia. Maybe never. He tried so hard to be a Christian, suffering all the taunts and the jeers.' Beth moved to the table and sat down. Now it was the slender Pakia who laid her long fingers on the woman's shoulder. Beth reached up and covered the soft, warm hand. I loved him, you know, when he was a real man. But I swear to God, you can't love a saint. She shook her head. Wherever he is, he must be hurting. Twenty years of his life gone to dust and ashes. It was not a waste, said Pakia, and it is not dust and ashes. He gave us pride and showed us the reality of God's love. 
That is no small gift, Beth. Maybe so, said Beth without conviction. Now, you must tell your people to head deep into the mountains. I fear there will be terrible violence before the month is out. Let's talk of more hunts. God will protect us, said Pakia. Trust in God, but keep your gun loaded, said Beth softly. We do not have guns, said Pakia. It's a quote, little one. It just means that sometimes God requires us to look after ourselves. Why do they hate us? Did not the deacon say we were all God's children? It was a simple question, and Beth had no answer for it. Laying the gun on the table, she sat down and stared at the wolver. No more than five feet tall, she was humanoid in shape, but her back was bent, her hands long and treble-jointed, ending in dark talons. Silver-grey fur covered her frame. I can't tell you why, Pakia, and I don't know why the deacon changed his mind. The unifiers now say you are abominations. I think they just mean different. But in my experience, men don't need too much of an excuse for hate. It just comes natural to them. You better go now, and don't come back for a time. I'll come into the mountains with some supplies in a little while, when things have cooled down a mite. I wish the preacher was here, said Pakia. Amen to that. But I'd sooner have the man he once was. Nesta counted the last of the notes and slipped them into a paper packet, which she sealed and added to the pile. One hundred and forty-six lumbermen and several hauliers were to be paid today, and the barter notes had only arrived late last night from Unity. Nesta glanced up at the armed guards outside the open doorway. "'I've finished!' he called. Closing the account ledger, Nesta stood and straightened his back. The first of the guards, a round-shouldered former lumberjack named Lemus, stepped inside and leaned his rifle against the shack wall. Nesta placed the payment packets in a canvas sack and handed it to Lemus. "'A long night for you, young'un,' said the guard. Nesta nodded. His eyes felt gritty and he yearned for sleep. "'The money was due yesterday morning,' he said wearily. "'We thought there'd been a raid.' "'They went the long way up through the gap.' Lemus told him. Thought they were being followed. Were they? Lemus shrugged. Who knows? But Leighton Duke is said to be in these parts, and that don't leave anyone feeling safe. Still, at least the money got here. Nestor moved to the doorway and pulled on his heavy topcoat. Outside, the mountain air was chill, the wind picking up. There were three wagons beyond the shack, carrying trace chains to haul the timber. The drivers were standing in a group, chatting, waiting for their pay. Turning to Lemus, Nestor said his farewells and strolled to the paddock, where the company horses were held. Taking a bridle from the tack-box, he warmed the bridle bar under his coat. Pushing a chilled bridle into a horse's warm mouth was a sure way of riling the beast. Choosing a buckskin gelding, he bridled and saddled him and set off down the mountain passing several more wagons carrying loggers and lumbermen to their day's labour. The sun was bright as Nesta turned off the mountain path and headed down towards Pilgrim's Valley. Far to the north he could see the squat, ugly factory building where meat was canned for shipment to the growing cities, and a little to the east, beyond the peaks, smoke had already started to swirl up from the ironworks, a dark spiral like a distant cyclone staining the sky. He rode on, past the broken sign with its fading letters, welcoming travellers to Pig's Valley Pop 827. More than 3,000 people now dwelt in the valley, and the demand for lumber for new homes meant stripping the mountainsides bare. A low rumbling sound caused him to rein in the buckskin, 
and he glanced up to see the twin-winged flying machine moving ponderously through the air. It was canvas-coloured, with a heavy engine at the front and fixed wheels on wings and tail. Nestor hated it, loathed the noise and the intrusion on his thoughts. As the machine came closer, the buckskin grew skittish. Nestor swiftly dismounted and took firm hold of the reins, stroking the gelding's head and blowing gently into its nostrils. The gelding began to tremble, but then the machine was past them, the sound disappearing over the valley. Nestor remounted and headed for home. As he rode into town, Nestor tried not to look at the charred area where the little church had stood, but his eyes were drawn to it. The bodies had all been removed, and workmen were busy clearing away the last of the blackened timbers. Nestor rode on, leaving his mount with a company ostler at the livery stable, and walking the last few hundred yards to his rooms above Josiah Broom's general store. The rooms were small, a square lounge that led through to a tiny, windowless bedroom. Nestor peeled off his clothes and sat by the lounge window, too tired to sleep. Idly, he picked up the book he had been studying. The cover was of cheap board, the title stamped in red. The New Elijah by Erskine Wright. The Crusader tests would be hard, he knew, and there was so little time to read. Rubbing his eyes, he leaned back and opened the book at the marked page and read the travels of the great saint. He fell asleep in the chair and awoke some three hours later. Yawning, he stood and rubbed his eyes. He heard sounds of shouting from the street below and moved to the window. A number of riders had drawn up, and one of them was being helped from the saddle, blood seeping from a wound in his upper chest. Dressing swiftly, Nestor ran down to the street in time to see Captain Leon Evans striding up to the group. The Crusader captain looked heroic in his grey, shield-fronted shirt and wide-brimmed black hat. He wore two guns belted high at the waist, gun butts reversed. "'The bitch shot him!' shouted Shem Jackson, his face ugly with rage. "'What are you going to do about it?' Evans knelt by the wounded man. "'Get him to Dr. Shriver's, and be damn quick about it, otherwise he'll bleed to death!' Several men lifted the groaning man and bore him along the sidewalk past Broom's store. Everyone began to speak at once, but Leon Evans raised his hands for silence. "'Just one!' he said, pointing to Jackson. Nestor didn't like the man, who was known for his surly manner when sober and his violent streak when drunk. Jackson hawked and spat. "'We spotted some wolvers on the edge of my property,' he said, rubbing a grimy hand across his thin lips. "'And me and the boys here rode out after them. We come near the McAdam place when she ups and shoots. Jack went down, then Miller's horse was shot out from under him. What are you going to do about it?' "'You were on her property?' asked Evans. "'What's that got to do with anything?' argued Jackson. "'You can't just go around shooting folks.' "'I'll talk to her,' promised Evans. "'But from now on you boys stay clear of Beth McAdam. You got that?' "'We want more than talk,' said Jackson. "'She's got to be dealt with. That's the law.' Evans smiled, but there was no humour in his expression. "'Don't tell me the law, Shem,' he said quietly. "'I know the law.' Beth McAdam gave fair warning that armed men were not to hunt on her property. She also let it be known that she would shoot any man who trespassed on her land in order to hunt wolvers. You shouldn't have gone there. Now, as I said, I'll speak to her. Yeah, you speak to her, hissed Jackson. But I tell you this, woman or no woman, no one shoots at me and gets away with it. Evans ignored him. Get on back to your homes, he said, and the men moved away. But Nestor could see they were heading for the Mother of Pearl drinking house. He stepped forward. The captain saw him, and his dark eyes narrowed. I hope you weren't with those men, said Evans. No, sir. I, I was sleeping up in my room. I just heard the commotion. I didn't think Mrs. McAdam would shoot anybody. She's one tough lady, Nestor. She was one of the first into Pilgrim's Valley. She fought the lizard men, and since then there have been two brigand raids out on the farm. Five were killed in a gun battle there some ten years back. 
Nesta chuckled. She was certainly tough in school. I remember that. So do I, said Evans. How's the studying going? Every time I try to read, I fall asleep, admitted Nesta. It must be done, Nesta. A man cannot follow God's path unless he studies God's word. I, I get confused, sir. The Bible is so full of killings and revenging. Hard to know what's right. That's why the Lord sends prophets like Daniel Cade and John Shano. You must study their words. Then the ways that are hidden will become known to you. And don't concern yourself about the violence, Nestor. All life is violence. There is the violence of disease, the violence of hunger and poverty. Even birth is violent. A man must understand these things. Nothing good ever comes easy. Nestor was still confused, but he didn't want to look foolish before his hero. Uh, yes, sir, he said. Evans smiled and patted the young man's shoulder. The deacon is sending one of his apostles to Pilgrim's Valley at the end of the month. Come and listen. I will, sir. What will you do about Mrs. McAdam? She's under a lot of strain, what with the preacher gone and the burning. I think I'll just stop by and talk with her. Samuel says he thinks the devil has got into her, said Nestor. He told me she threw him out the house and called him an abomination. He's a weak man. Often happens to youngsters who have strong parents. But I hope he isn't right. Time will tell. Is it true that Leighton Duke and his men are nearby? asked Nestor. His gang was shot to pieces down near Pernham. So I doubt it, said the crusader. They tried to rob a barter coach heading for the mines. Is he dead, then? Evans laughed. Don't sound disappointed, boy. He's a brigand. Nestor reddened. Oh, I'm not disappointed, sir, he lied. It's just that he's, you know, famous and kind of romantic. Evans shook his head. I never found anything romantic about a thief. He's a man who hasn't the heart or the strength for work and steals from other better men. Set your sights on heroes a little bigger than Leighton Duke, Nestor. Yes, sir, promised the youngster. Text copyright David A. Gemmell, 1989. Production copyright Ashet Audio, 2017. This has been an Ashet Audio production. Audible hopes you've enjoyed this program.